Up next, author and surgeon Ben Carson. The Presidential Medal of Freedom recipient talks about his life, from poverty to the top of the medical field, the current political landscape in the U.S., and the Affordable Care Act. The former director of pediatric neurosurgery at Johns Hopkins is the author of five books, including Gifted Hands, The Big Picture, and his 2012 release, America the Beautiful. Dr. Ben Carson, who are the Bender twins? Well, the Bender twins were conjoined twins, joined at the back of the head from West Germany, that we separated at Johns Hopkins in 1987. Uh, they were the first twins of that type, very complex, to be separated and both survive. And today? Uh, as far as I know, they're still surviving, but I, I must admit I lost contact with them quite some time ago because uh, it's sort of a sad story, but the mother remarried a few years later. Uh, the new husband wasn't interested in taking care of them, and they became wards of the state. How did you get involved in that type of surgery? I became very interested in conjoined twins just out of the blue. And I started reading a lot about them, and I was trying to figure out why were the results so dismal. I said, you know, this is 1987, you know. Modern times, now we think of it as ancient, but <laughs> those times. And uh, as I read and read, I, I finally concluded that it was exsanguination or bleeding to death, which seemed to be the big problem. And I was talking to a friend, Bruce Wrights, who was the chief of cardiothoracic surgery at that time, and he had a lot of experience with hypothermic arrest, and he'd done research and, and had practiced a technique in which basically, you know, you cool the body temperature, pump all the blood out, the heart stops, and you can operate on a child for up to an hour before you have to warm the blood up and infuse it back in and start the heart up. And I was thinking, wow, during a critical time during the separation, if you could go on hyperthermic arrest, get the vessels reconstructed, and then start things up again, maybe they wouldn't bleed to death. And then I was saying, wait a minute, why am I thinking about this? <laughs> I'm never going to see a set of those twins. Lo and behold, two months later, uh, here came these German doctors presenting this case around to different medical centers, wanting to know if anybody had a solution because the mother was not willing to accept the solution that had been proposed in Europe, which basically was for her to choose the one she wanted and the other one to be chopped off. And, uh, you know, she loved them both. She just couldn't do that. And uh, so I started explaining uh, this whole concept of using the very modern techniques that we had for doing all kinds of craniofacial surgery and hypothermic arrest together. And uh, everybody said, you know what? That sounds like it might work. And, uh, you know, our chief of anesthesia, Mark Rogers, at that time, really enthusiastic. And we started pulling together a team and talking about this. And one of the, one of the great things about being at an institution like Hopkins is that you can draw on people from lots of different specialties, all of whom are tops in their field. And you sit down and talk. But uh, not only the physicians, but... You know, the, the nurses, uh, the aides, everybody, we got involved. We started pulling together teams and practicing, and asking people, how do you see this from your point of view, getting everybody's opinions, even the engineers. How do we ensure that we don't have a power failure? Uh, the, the head nurse uh, in neurosurgery played psychiatrist with me, uh, would have me lay down on the couch, close my eyes, and just tell me what instruments do you need? And I would just go through it. She would write everything down, put together a manual. Uh, the nurses actually created accordion sleeve uh, drapes so that you put it over the bed. And when the time came to pull the beds apart, they would fall into place to maintain the sterility of the field. I mean, that level of detail. And, uh, you know, I get an awful lot of credit as being the neurosurgeon who was the first one to, to separate twins like that. But, uh, you know, I could not have done it without all those other people. It was a team effort. Everybody's input was needed. And, and I've used that same principle throughout my surgical career, recognizing that, you know, 
as the Bible says, and a multitude of counselors is safety. Dr. Carson, uh, you talk about the Bender twins in your first book, Gifted Hands, the Ben Carson story. How many Siamese twins have you separated? How long does such a surgery take? Uh, I have uh, personally uh, been involved with five sets, uh, and then I've been involved as a consultant for a number of others uh, in this country and elsewhere as well. Uh, they usually take a very long period of time. Uh, you know, anywhere from, you know, 12 to 18 hours to a few days. <laughs> it goes on and on. And uh, I think, though, uh, we are learning. People are learning a lot more about these kinds of things. And uh, there's so many wonderful techniques that are coming up. Uh, I think, you know, within the next 20 years, these kinds of separations will be possible with very good outcomes in general. So... Uh, the other thing that is helping is the use of virtual reality. Um, and, and one set of twins that I helped with in Singapore, um, the uh, team that I worked with, I had worked with before while I was in the United States, and they were elsewhere. Uh, but uh, the second set of twins that I was involved with in South Africa, I had the advantage of using the virtual workbench at Johns Hopkins, which we can take the CAT scan, the MRI, the angiogram, any radiological studies, integrate them into a three-dimensional model, put on your 3D glasses, and there it is sitting right in front of you. And I was able to study the anatomy in those brains. Unfortunately, I couldn't take that with me to South Africa, but at least I had seen it, uh, sort of like a cab driver in New York City. You know, if you've been there for a while and you've been driving through, you sort of at least have some impression of which way to go and which way not to go. And in fact, there came a point during that surgery uh, when it was almost impossible to decipher, you know, which vessels went to which twin. And, and I was able to think back on those three-dimensional images and figure out what was going where, which I don't think I would have been able to do otherwise. And it turns out that, you know, that was the, the first case of very complexly joined type 1 vertical twins uh, in which both uh, ended up neurologically intact. You talk about in that book being able to see in 3D. Yeah, uh, a lot of people, you know, they, they see things more or less in two dimensions. Uh, somebody who sees things in three dimensions is able to keep relationships uh, in their mind, for instance, uh, I'm looking at you, I'm looking at a camera behind you, a bookcase, all these uh, various other things. And then if I were to close my eyes and spin around, you know, if I'm a three-dimensional thinker, I can still imagine exactly where you are, where the camera is, where those books are, where the telephone is. And that's very important, particularly when you're, you're operating in a substance like the brain which doesn't have a lot of visual landmarks. So, you know, you see one thing here, one thing here, and then you have to utilize those things to tell you where everything else is. Otherwise, you know, all your patients come out you know, looking like that. So uh, it's a very important uh, feature for neurosurgeons. When you were eight years old, 1959, two things happened. You want to talk about your father and what you told your mother you wanted to be when you grew up? Yeah, well, you know, my, my parents got divorced. Uh, I was eight years old. I got to tell you, that was absolutely devastating. You know, like all little boys, you're just so thrilled when your dad comes home. I remember I used to, about the time he was supposed to come home, I'd run out to the alley and be looking down the alley to see if he was coming. And if he was, I'd go running off to him. And, uh, you know, your, your dad just about always is sort of like your hero. And, uh, you know, he would, he would let us drive, you know, sit in his lap and at least, you know, steer the wheel and stuff like that. It was just, uh, it was cool. And I loved playing with the veins on his hands because they were big and you push them and they pop back out. And uh, it, was, it was just cool. Um, so when it came time for them to get divorced, you know, I just couldn't understand. And, uh, you know, I wondered, you know, was it something that I did? And I just 
beg my mother to let him come back. She never badmouthed him. She never really even told us what the reason was until we were really old enough to understand it. But in fact, um, he was a bigamist. He had another family. And when he married her, she was 13. He was 28. Um, and uh, of course, that uh, that was extraordinarily difficult for her because now she had the responsibility of trying to raise two young sons on her own in inner city Detroit, later inner city Boston, and then back to Detroit after she got her footing. Um, and that was very difficult. She only had a third grade education. And, um, you know, she worked very hard as a domestic, cleaning people's houses, leaving at five in the morning, usually not getting back before midnight, going from job to job to job. Uh, she, for some reason, just had a disdain for welfare um, in the sense that she was very observant and she noticed that no one that she ever saw go on it came off of it and she just didn't like the idea of being dependent you know her whole life so she figured she would work as long and as hard as she needed to and that somehow you know God would take care of her and uh, you know I was an awful student and uh, but I, I just loved the whole concept of medicine. Anytime there was a story on television or the radio about medicine, I was right there. I just loved hearing about the stories. Interestingly enough, uh, a lot of the big medical breakthroughs when I was a little kid seemed to be coming out of Johns Hopkins. So I even internalized as a little kid that one day I wanted to work at Johns Hopkins. Um, but I, you know, I told my mother I wanted to be a doctor. I said, Mother, do you think I can be a doctor? And uh, as she would always say, Benny, you can be anything you want to be. You can be the best at anything you want to be because you're a smart boy. And uh, it took a lot for her to say that because I wasn't manifesting the characteristics of a smart boy. You know, I was a terrible student. Uh, people called me dummy. I thought I was stupid. Everybody else thought I was stupid except for my mother who was always telling me, you're smart, you can do it, and you can do it better than anybody else can. Where did you go to medical school? Uh, I went to medical school at the University of Michigan. And uh, I must... Undergrad? Hmm? Under, undergrad? And uh, undergraduate, I went to Yale. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of interesting how all of that occurred, but, you know, I was at Southwestern High School in inner city Detroit, uh, it turns out I did uh, extremely well on the SATs, um, and you know I had very good grades. I had become the city executive officer at ROTC, uh, but you know I only had enough money to apply to one college, so I decided to apply to the college that won the grand championship in college ball. Uh, GE College Ball was my favorite TV program, and uh, you know Yale won. So I said, okay, I'll apply to Yale. And fortunately, they accepted me with a scholarship. And, uh, but uh, when I went off to medical school at the University of Michigan, um, I was thinking I was, I was pretty tough. You know, wow, you know, you're, you're good. But uh, I did horribly on that first set of comprehensive exams. I mean, really bad to the point where I was sent to see my counselor. And I looked at my record, and he says, you seem like an intelligent young man. I bet there are a lot of things you could do outside of medicine. And he tried to convince me to drop out of medical school, says I wasn't cut out to be a doctor. Well, needless to say, I was devastated. And he said, you know, we can get you into another discipline. It's only been six weeks, and you will not have wasted a whole year, which seemed like a kind thing, but... I was devastated. I, I went back to my apartment and I just prayed. I said, Lord, help me. I've always wanted to be a doctor. I, I, it, it doesn't look good for me. Help me. And I just started thinking about my whole academic career. I said, what kind of courses have you struggled in? What kind of courses have you done very well in? And I realized I struggled in courses where I listened to a lot of boring lectures. And I did very well in, in courses where I did a lot of reading. There I was listening to six to eight hours worth of boring lectures most days, not getting anything out of them, wasting that time. I couldn't afford to waste six to eight hours a day while I was in medical school. 
So I made an executive decision to skip the boring lectures and to spend that time reading. And the rest of medical school was a snap after that. And, uh, you know, some years later when I went back uh, as the commencement speaker at my medical school, I was looking for that counselor to tell him he wasn't cut out to be a counselor. Because, you know, so many people are just so negative. And they're always looking for reasons to explain why you can't do something rather than helping you figure out why you can. And, and that's one of the reasons that, that I and my wife have spent so much time, you know, trying to encourage young people, encourage them to read, encourage them to excel academically, encouraging them to use their talents to help other people. Those are the things that make for great leaders and for a great nation. And in your 2000 book, The Big Picture, you talk about skipping 80% of your lectures in, in medical school. Absolutely. And, and you know, <clears throat> I don't want anybody listening to say, Dr. Carson said I should skip my lectures. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that everybody learns differently. Some people, lectures are incredibly useful. Some people, it's repetition. Some people, it's discourse and, and conversation. It really depends. And I always say to young people, learn how you learn. Dr. Ben Carson is our guest this month on Book TV's In-Depth program. He is the author of five books in 1990. He wrote Gifted Hands, The Ben Carson Story. Think Big came out in 1996, Unleashing Your Potential for Excellence. The Big Picture in 2000, Take the Risk, Learning to Identify, Choose, and Live with Acceptable Risk came out in 08. And his newest book, America the Beautiful, Rediscovering What Made This Nation Great, was in 2011. Dr. Carson, how do you get from gifted hands to America the Beautiful, where you begin that book by asking essentially a philosophical policy question, whether or not we're still following the vision of the Founding Fathers? Yes, that's a very good question. Uh, first of all, I never intended to be an author, but uh, after the Bender Twin operation, um, you know, a lot of people wanted me to talk about the operation, and then they started wanting to hear about my background, and people were just flabbergasted. And it was kind of interesting how it all worked out because, you know, they say everybody gets their 15 minutes of fame. Well, you know, my first 15 minutes uh, had to do with hemispherectomies, an operation in which we remove half the brain. And then my second 15 minutes, a year later, had to do with intrauterine surgery, operating babies still in the mother's womb. And then I said to my wife, if there's a third 15 minutes, you know, our lives will probably change because I said, the media isn't stupid. And they'll say, wait a minute, isn't that the same guy? And then they'll want to look into my background and say, are you kidding me where this guy came from? And I said, it will all change. And of course, that's exactly what happened. And then, uh, you know, a lot of publishers started coming to me and saying, you should write a book. And I said, I don't want to write a book. After about the 10th publisher, I said, I should write a book. So I wrote uh, Gifted Hands. Uh, and I remember the initial publisher said, this is a great autobiography. It'll probably sell 14, 15,000 copies, which is really great for an autobiography. Of course, it's sold well over a million. Um, and then, you know, what about your philosophy, they want to know. How did all this happen? Uh, and my philosophy is think big. Each one of those letters means something special. Uh, so I wrote that book. And then, uh, you know, I resisted any urges and any appeals to write another book uh, for a few years. But then, you know, I started looking around and I was noticing that people seemed to get caught up in little stuff and they miss the big stuff. And they're just squabbling and, 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 and using all their energy in the wrong places. And I said, I need to write another book. <laughs> so that was the impetus behind the big picture. And then uh, a few years later, you know, I said, there's something different going on in America. You know, you, you, you go to the store, you buy a piece of electronic equipment uh, that maybe cost uh, $169, and then they want to sell you this, this warranty that costs another $150 for three years, and, oh, you got to have this. And, 
and I'm saying, does that make any sense? You know, if you put aside all the money that you're paying all these warranties for, just put that in a separate account. You can replace anything that you ever buy. <laughs> it's pretty, pretty amazing. But we've become so risk adverse that we easily fall prey to anybody who comes along and says, well, you know, this might happen, this might happen. You know, I, I'm aware of instances where they try to sell you so-called wind insurance in certain parts of Florida for $25,000 a year. Now, think about it. If you take that $25,000 and you put it into an account, in 10 years, it's $250,000. You'll be able to take care of any wind insurance that comes along, and it probably won't, and you got $250,000. It's pretty amazing. I'm sure the insurance company doesn't like me saying this, but that's the reality. You prey on people's fears, and sometimes people lead their lives based on fear rather based on courage. So that's why I decided to write that book. And then, uh, you know, the latest book, America the Beautiful, and I should say that uh, the first uh, four books were all written with professional co-writers. Uh, the latest book, America the Beautiful, was written with my wife. And it's the first one that ever actually made it to number one in the New York Times bestseller list. Um, <laughs> and it's still on the New York Times bestseller list. But, um, you know, I, I was becoming increasingly concerned. You know, I have a granddaughter now and another grandchild on the way. You know, I have three sons. Uh, I started worrying about their future and uh, looking at how America seemed to be changing from a can-do society to a what-can-you-do-for-me society. And, 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 and hearing a lot of people saying very negative things about America, looking at how some of the history is revised. And I said, you know what? Let me write a book about America, uh, which has been a very good nation to me, and give people real perspective on why this nation came into being. And instead of rewriting history, let me put in a lot of quotes from people who were involved so that you can actually determine for yourself what they were saying and what they meant. And, uh, you know, it, uh, it was quite an endeavor. Uh, but uh, obviously, um, you know, if you look at the comments of people who've read it, uh, it has struck a chord. And, uh, you know, I'm actually working on another book right now uh, called One Nation. Uh, basically, the theme of which is to help America to realize that we're not each other's enemies. You know, we've allowed ourselves to be pawns, to be manipulated by political factions and uh, certain aspects of the media so that we're at each other's throats all the time rather than learning how to work together to solve problems. And, uh, you know, there are those who enhance themselves and enhance their positions by creating friction and, uh, and, and creating their own little power base. And uh, we, the American people, have got to be able to see, that, see through that because a wise man once said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. And we need the kind of leadership that brings people together and helps to create a vision. The book of Proverbs, uh, chapter 29, verse 18, without a vision, the people perish. Can you give an example what you mean by being pawns? Yeah, uh, by, I'll give you a perfect example. Um, you know, there are a group of people who have come along and said, people who sit there and tell you that you have to have voter ID are racist. And they're just trying to keep you from voting and stirring up people and getting them excited about something that is a non-issue anywhere else in the world. You know, I travel a lot throughout the world, and in the last year, year and a half, I've taken it upon myself to ask in every country I've gone, uh, how do you vent, prevent voter fraud? They all have some form of national identification. It's not even an issue. And to allow yourself to be whipped into a frenzy by people coming along saying <coughs> that that's a racist thing, that is so totally absurd. And I want people to really stop and, and, and think these things through rather than just allowing people to whip them up into frenzies. In America the Beautiful, Rediscovering What Made This Nation Great, you write, 
Capitalism is a system that works extremely well for someone who is highly motivated and very energetic, but it is not a great system for someone who is not interested in working hard or for someone who feels no need to contribute to the economic well-being of their community. Exactly. I think that's, that's, that's largely self-explanatory. You know, in a capitalistic system, uh, you work, you earn, you benefit. Uh, in a socialistic type of system, now you work if you want, you don't work if you don't want, but you know, everybody's going to take care of you. So, you know, one kind of system is certainly very good for people who are energized and ready to work and recognize that those initially were the kind of people who were drawn to America because, you know, in England and other parts of Europe and other parts of the world, people would frequently work extremely hard just for the government, <laughs> they wouldn't be really be working for themselves. And they saw an opportunity where they could come here and they could use that same energy, but it would accrue unto them and unto their families. So you had that kind of motivated individual coming over here and they did work extraordinarily hard and they created uh, an, a lot of products. Um, and then their, their mothership started saying, gosh, you guys are doing a lot of stuff over there. Uh, you know, I should get some of that. You know, I protected you and everything. And and really, you know, you started the basis of the uh, the Tea Party movement uh, at that time. People saying, look, uh, this is our stuff. We worked for this. We're the ones who did all the work. You don't get it. So, um, and that's okay. Now, at the same time, I am very quick to, to add that those very same people who were motivated like that, who came here, who, who created wealth for themselves, also were very generous to the people around them. You know, they created all kinds of things that benefited other people, including, you know, factories and textile mills, charitable foundations, uh, institutions of higher education, um, taking care of people who could not take care of themselves, you know, hospitals, infirmaries, you know, we've always done that. And I think we have a duty to do that. That is our responsibility. You know, uh, some people say, am I my brother's keeper? You know, uh, obviously that's what Cain said about Abel. Uh, yes. I say, yes, you are your brother's keeper. If your brother is unable to take care of himself, then you do have a responsibility to do that. You know, we're human beings and we should have humanitarian qualities. All of us should. And we always have in this country. And uh, it is a complete uh, falsification for people to come along and say that we haven't done that. We're the most generous nation the world has ever known. Dr. Carson, in your book, Think Big, which is an acronym for talent, honest, insight, nice, knowledge, books, in-depth knowledge, and God. G stands for God. Have you gotten in trouble for that G in Think Big? Uh, certainly. Um, I remember uh, some years ago a group of lawyers came to us and said you can't put those banners up in a public school because the G stands for God and they said you know that's a violation of the First Amendment there can be no government support of religious expression I said uh, excuse me the First Amendment says there can be no government suppression of religious expression so we had a rather vigorous argument and uh, I suggested that uh, that we resolve it at the level of the Supreme Court, which seems, you know, bold and reckless, but it really wasn't because I knew the next week I was going to the Supreme Court to receive the Jefferson Award. And I figured I would ask while I was there, and I did. And just as Sandra Day O'Connor said, they were all wet. They had no idea what the First Amendment said. They had no idea what separation of church and state was. Of course, that was not a violation. And, you know, what has happened is, is people have somehow distorted the meaning of our Constitution and its amendment. There was never any intention that you could not have God in your life. And uh, there was never anything that said you can't talk about God in public. You know, this is absolute absurdity. But what has happened is that the secular progressive movement has, has beat this drum so loudly that many people, even in the legislature, think that it's true, that you're not supposed to do that, that somehow that violates something, and it absolutely does not. 
Uh, I'm a deep believer in separation of church and state. I understand why it was done because, you know, in the old world, um, you know, in the name of the church, there were a lot of state atrocities committed. No question about that. Um, and then there were circumstances where the sto state tried to control the church. There's no room for that in America. But there also is no room for intolerance of people's religious beliefs. 202 is the area code if you would like to participate in our conversation this afternoon with Dr. Ben Carson, 585-3880. If you live in the East or Central time zones, 585-3881. If you live in the Mountain or Pacific time zones, you can also, if you can't get through on the phone lines, you can send Dr. Carson a tweet. At BookTV is our handle. You can send an email, booktv at cspan.org. Or you can make a comment on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash booktv. It's right up there at the top in the comment section underneath uh, uh, the uh, notice for Dr. Carson. I want to start with this email from Pamela Bland, okay. who's a doctor. <clears throat> Pardon me, here in the uh, Washington area. Uh, my name is Dr. Pamela Bland. I am a pediatric anesthesiologist at Walter Reed National Military Center in Bethesda. My question is, do you think you've become more jaded or more inspired over the past two decades? The reason I'm asking this is that you have become, over the years, a lot more vocal on your stance on issues affecting the nation. Well, I don't think uh, I'm either of those things. I think uh, I have become more concerned with what's going on and recognize that, you know, there is no purpose in curing the organism and then putting it back into a sick environment. And, you know, sometimes people think that physicians should stick to medicine. I don't generally hear people saying that about lawyers for some strange reason, but they feel that physicians should stick to medicine. And I'm very quick to point out that five physicians signed a Declaration of Independence and were involved in the Bill of Rights, the uh, U.S. Constitution. There's absolutely no reason that we cannot think outside of the operating room or the clinic. But <clears throat> in doing so and in looking at what's going on, uh, I uh, have become extraordinarily concerned. And I think all citizens should be concerned. Um, and, you know, our system uh, of representation was a very good system, the way it was put together. There were supposed to be uh, representatives who were doctors, lawyers, businessmen, farmers, teachers, you know, drugstore owners, what have you. Why? Because you wanted all the interests to be represented. And as we've become more homogenous in the sense of, having representatives who sort of come from one group or another as opposed to everybody. We don't really get the kind of representation that we need. And we also get a lot of representation of special interests, way more than we should. And it has completely distorted the system of values in this country. Uh, I'm, I'm almost to the point of saying we, we ought to consider a constitutional convention we ought to talk about, you know, what's going on uh, because it has been so drastically distorted and there have been so many things that have changed. You know, you look at, for instance, uh, federal court uh, judge appointments for lifetime. Well, you know, when we put that in place, people lived on average 47 years. Yeah, that has changed pretty dramatically. Uh, should we look at that? Should we look at things that have been affected by drastic changes in our society and adjust accordingly? I think probably there's some wisdom in doing that. Well, saying all that, Tom Chastain from Tampa, Florida asks you, what is your political future? Um, my political future is to continue to, to raise these issues, to continue to talk you know, I have been just uh, flabbergasted as I travel around the country. You know, I retired July the 1st. Uh, hadn't been much of retirement because I'm in a different state almost every day. But, you know, the enormous crowds, the great enthusiasm of people who resonate with common sense. They, uh, and a lot of them tell me that they thought that they were the only ones who thought that way. And they're so happy to hear that somebody else thinks that way. And uh, 
you know, here's the interesting thing. You know, the, the, the secular progressive movement, I think, is, is very largely in sync with, uh, with Saul Alinsky. And if you read his book, Rules for Radicals, that would be a good book to talk about sometimes. Um, you know, number one rule, you get the majority to believe that their opinion is the minority opinion. And yours is the majority opinion. And if you can co-opt the media in the process, you'll be far ahead in the game. And then you can intimidate them into silence. And, uh, you know, what I'd like to do is, is pull the veil off of that uh, and, uh, and get people to be courageous again and to be willing to stand up for what they believe in uh, and not allow the whole fabric of America to be changed without a discussion. You know, if we can have a good open discussion and not all this subterfuge, and the majority of people who are well informed about the ideal say, you know what, we don't really want a country that's for up and by the people. We want a country that's for up and by the government. And if that's what the majority of people decide, I'm perfectly willing to live with that. What I don't want is all of this devious stuff going on where we change the country without a discussion. Lawrence Brecht dentist in New York City. Uh, while much has been said regarding your political thoughts, I have not heard much in the media regarding your decision to leave a stellar surgical career behind, which you just mentioned. Unfortunately, he writes, I have seen too many of my colleagues at the peak of their careers decide to leave medicine as well, citing the impending changes that the Affordable Care Act will impose. Well, you know, my decision to, to leave medicine uh, was in place long before the Affordable Care Act actually came into being. And in fact, I stayed a few years longer than I intended to. Um, someone told me that neurosurgeons die early. I didn't believe it. Um, and I wrote down the names of the, ten la the last 10 neurosurgeons I knew who died. And I calculated their average age of death, and it was 61. And I'm 61 now. And I said, you know what, maybe I should think about doing something else. But also, you know, I became increasingly concerned about what was going on in the world. And I knew that I could not devote adequate time to it in an extremely busy neurosurgical practice. And then couple that with the fact that, you know, we've brought into the, uh, the neurosurgical department at Johns Hopkins some incredibly talented pediatric neurosurgeons. I mean, world class, really good. So I didn't feel that I was absolutely needed. I didn't have to go away and feel guilty about it. And uh, it was a perfect time for me. Well, it was February 2013, and uh, you were on a national stage. And we want to show our audience a little bit of video and then have you explain what was going on. OK. What about our taxation system? so complex, there is no one who can possibly comply with every jot and tittle of our tax. And say, if I wanted to get you or you, I could get you on a tax issue. That doesn't make any sense. What we need to do is come up with something that's simple. And when I pick up my Bible, you know what I see? I see the fairest individual in the universe, God, and he's given us a system. It's called tithe. Now, we don't necessarily have to do it 10%. But it's principle. He didn't say, if your crops fail, don't give me any tithes. He didn't say, if you have a bumper crop, give me triple tithes. So there must be something inherently fair about proportionality. You make $10 billion, you put in a billion. You make $10, you put in one. Of course, you've got to get rid of the loopholes. But now, now some people say, they say, well, that's not fair because it doesn't hurt the guy who made $10 billion as much as the, the guy who made 10. Where does it say you have to hurt the guy? He just put a billion dollars in the pot. You know, we don't need to hurt him. You know, it's, it's that kind of thinking, it's that kind of thinking that has resulted in 602 banks in the Cayman Islands. That money needs to be back here, building our infrastructure and creating jobs. And we're smart enough, we're smart enough to figure out how to do that. Dr. Carson, where were you? Uh, well, I was sort of in a zone at that time. People say, but the president was just a few feet away from you. Uh, you know, I wasn't really thinking about who was there. I was talking about what I deeply believe. 
and 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 the things that I, I feel can be of tremendous benefit to us as a nation. And uh, you know, a taxation system, as I said, that is as complex as ours, is really the precursor to a totalitarian society because if I don't like you and you're a really, really good guy and I can't find anything, I can get you on a tax issue. I can always do that. I don't like that system. And uh, we need to have something that is fair and that is simple. Now, you know, some people consider it fair to take from the rich and redistribute to the poor. Well, on the surface, that sounds pretty good. Robin Hood, great. Uh, the, the problem with that is that um, where do you define rich and where do you refine poor? Everybody has different definitions of that. So it's better to do something where there's not a lot of variation in the definition. That's where proportionality comes into play. That's why a tithing system is so fair. You know, you make very little, you pay very little. You make a whole lot, you pay a lot. The reason that it doesn't seem fair is because we have all these loopholes. And you have the ability, if you have a lot of money, to buy expensive tax lawyers and accountants and do all these manipulations and get out of paying taxes. That's unreasonable. So you've got to get rid of all those loopholes and truly make it fair. Then it's extremely predictable. You don't have people trying to escape it. You don't have money offshore. You have it back here working where it should be working. And I don't think we would have nearly the problems that we have if we would do that. The other thing you have to remember is, in the example that I use, the guy who put a billion dollars in and the guy who put one dollar in, even though one guy just put in a billion times more than the other, they have the same rights. That to me seems awfully fair. You take a system on the other hand where you know half the people don't even pay any federal income taxes, but they get to have a say in how much the other half pays. I mean, that's fair. Give me a break. You know, we need to start thinking about things that work for everybody. And in the process of doing that, I think we will not have any limitation in the number of jobs that are created and in the opportunities that are provided. You know, as someone who grew up in the very lowest rungs of society in terms of socioeconomic status, to be able to rise to where I am now, it's because we had a system that allowed that. The system still does, although it's getting more difficult. And I want to make sure that it remains easy for people who are willing to work extremely hard and do the right things to be successful in our society. What was the political reaction to your speech with the president sitting right there? <laughs> well, um, there were a lot of people who were shocked. And to me, that's, <clears throat> that's alarming, that we in America, the land of the free of the land of freedom would be shocked that someone would say something in the presence of the president that the president might not agree with you know that tells you how far astray we've gone we should not be shocked about that but of course there was you know obviously the the video went viral <laughs> it was you virtually can't you can't find anybody who hadn't seen it but uh but that's okay uh and there was criticism from you know the sort of secular progressive regions and from the more traditional and conservative regions there was great praise. Uh, you know the Wall Street Art Journal came out the next day, Carson for president. Um, and uh, you know uh, that might have been a little tongue-in-cheek but the, the, the fact of the matter is um, the response, the letters, the emails, the packages, the books, I mean my office you could barely get in the door and uh, the thing that affected me the most, though, were the letters that I got from elderly Americans, a lot, that said, Doctor, I'm an elderly American. I fought in World War II or whatever, and I was just waiting to die because I'd given up on America until I heard you speak. And I got a lot of responses like that, and I get that all the time every place that I go. And uh, therefore, I'm continuing to speak out. I will continue to speak out because I want people to understand the nation that we live in, and I don't want them to be manipulated. Javier in Corpus Christi, Texas, you're on Book TV with Dr. Ben Carson. 
Good morning. First, I'd like to say what an honor, Dr. Carson, to be addressing you this morning. It's, it's, a, it's a real honor. Um, what I wanted to uh, comment on was uh, regarding uh, your earlier comments about where one of your counselors, I believe, tried to, I guess, misdirect you from continuing uh, in the in the medical field. I, I understand exactly where you're coming from because when I was uh, attending college, I was told the same thing. And, and then uh, my daughter was told the same thing by her high school counselor uh, when my daughter uh, mentioned to her that she wanted to attend the University of Texas and her counselor told her you'll be lucky if you can get into uh, uh, your your most uh, public or local uh, community college which uh, offended her also and I'm proud to say that now she's in your in her junior year at the University of Texas and just completed 15 hours very successfully uh, my question to you is uh, what what can you tell the counselors out there that are listening, the ones in high school counselors, the uh, and the college counselors? What can you do? Uh, what can you tell them to to change their, their their rationale, their way of thinking in addressing students? You know, and and I hope uh, also to to say that I hope we get to see you down here at the at the Texas uh, uh, book fair. Hopefully later on this year. Once again, it's an honor. Thank you, Dr. Javier. Before we let you go, what do you do for a living? I am a physical education coach. Thank you very much. Okay. Dr. Well, Carson. Well, first of all, uh, I, I, I do want to say that community colleges serve a very important purpose in our society. Uh, they're great. But um, as, as far as, as counselors, particularly high school counselors, are concerned, recognize that anybody with a normal human brain has enormous potential. And what we need to be looking at is how do we uh, cultivate that potential because that helps us all in the long run and never try to dumb someone down or lead them into a place where they're not utilizing that tremendous potential that God has provided for us. In the long run, it's going to help you when you retire because you're going to have someone in the next generation who is very productive who is, uh, you know, allowing you to lead a much better retirement. So let's, let's try to push people upward rather than downward. David in Peoria, Illinois, please go ahead with your question or comment. Yes, thank you for being here, Dr. Carson. Um, do you believe that anything that's happened since 1900 has helped the uh, human race as far as women voting, um, fair wages, anything? David, David, what's your answer to that question? David? Yes. What's your answer? To, turn down your TV and just, uh, what is your answer to that question that you just asked? I am flabbergasted that Dr. Carson is able to sit here and deny that progressives have not had a hand and helping the human cause throughout history. I all mean, right. we all want we all want the help up to to succeed. And I just I think that Carson is slightly naive when he sits around and talks about people just doing their best and helping themselves out. All right, thank you, David. Dr. Carson. Well, first of all, uh, I don't. Uh, recall having said that anyone was not important and helpful. What, I, uh, what you may be alluding to is the fact that I talk about agendas that certain secular progressives have. People who want to take God out of our society, take godly principles out of our society, and substitute for it, you know, their own principles. You know, those people are perfectly willing or, or or welcome to be here as far as I'm concerned. But what I don't like is when they try to thrust their opinions onto everybody else and keep other people from being able to express themselves and express their opinions. Uh, you know, in terms of being able to help with women's suffrage, with civil rights, with all those things, I think everybody has had a role in that. And, uh, you know, one of the things that I don't particularly appreciate is when, when individuals come along and try to, to, to castigate, you know, something that I'm saying by distorting it. Uh, with 
America the Beautiful with your speech at the National Prayer Breakfast. Is this kind of the first time that you face criticism, <laughs> um, <clears throat> like not, such as David? Uh, not by a long shot. <laughs> uh, you know, I've, you know, I'm out there, and uh, you know, I don't, don't hide my opinions. Uh, you know, I've been involved in medical controversies. You know, when I first started advocating you know, cervical medullary decompression, which is a, a type of operation in, in dwarfs, in achondroplastic dwarfs. You know, at the first international conference on human achondroplasia in 1986 in Rome, you know, many of the world geneticists were saying, you surgeons are the ones who cause these people to die. And uh, even at Hopkins, there were some people against, you know, me doing this. But, you know, now it's something that's, you know, very well accepted and done. You know, there was controversy around hemispherectomies. No, not a problem. You know, there's been controversies uh, politically about some of my stands, you know, my pro-life stands and things of that nature. I've, I've faced uh, that before. I will continue to face it, and I don't have any problem facing it. Um, and I expect to face it. And, and, you know, one thing that I tell young people all the time is if everybody loves you and they love everything you do and everything you say you're probably not doing anything you're probably not saying anything <laughs> next call for ben carson comes from robert in starkville mississippi hi robert hey how you doing good please go ahead sir uh, uh nice to talk with you all today um in 97 uh, 98 school year, I was in middle school in Starkville, Mississippi, and uh, Dr. Carson came to speak to our stu to us as students in the uh, at the school. Um, and I want to know was he making uh, a national tour to uh, to come to visit the different states and different schools? Because we also had to read his book and write research reports in middle school. So, and um, and I, yeah, I want to know was he planning on making those types of trips in you? Robert, what did you think of uh, Dr. Carson's visit when you were in uh, middle school? Uh, one of the, one, and this is the reason I'm calling. One of the uh, things that stood out to me in his book was, uh, you know, he had an, he said he had an anger management problem, and so uh, in my town, that's one of the things that is uh, with the young people. Um, that is that is on the rise uh, regarding the anger. A lot of them armed robberies, uh, arising murders, and so he decided he found a way to to channel the energy and to direct it elsewhere. And so I wanted to know, and that's what stuck out to me in his book. And I believe I wrote on that topic, uh, but it was in '97, '98, so I don't, you know, really remember. But I want to know, um, could could he bring that energy back to into circulating throughout the United States and for okay. some of the young people. Well, thank you. And could you tell the, uh, the temper story as well? Yes, I, I will. Um, thank you so much. And I've been actually traveling uh, around the country uh, giving talks uh, for more than 20 years uh, and getting involved in various uh, community uh, activities and charitable uh, organizations, uh, which is one of the reasons, quite frankly, that... Uh, that people knew, the vast majority of people who know me, a few months ago when certain progressives were trying to paint me as a homophobe, knew that that was a bunch of crap. Um, and it's, it's very good, you know, when, you're li when you have a lifetime to point out who you are as opposed to a, a short period of time where someone, you know, tries to castigate you. Having said that, um, I was an extraordinarily uh, selfish young person uh, as an adolescent and I was a person who thought I had a lot of rights. The more rights you think you have, the more likely someone is to infringe upon your rights. So people were always infringing on my rights and I would go after people with baseball bats, I would get in fights uh, and once I even tried to stab a, another youngster with a knife, the scene is, is well depicted in the movie Gifted Hands uh, which Cuba Gooding Jr. Uh, plays my part. But, um, you know, after that incident, I locked myself in the bathroom and I started contemplating my life and I realized, you know, trying to kill somebody over nothing, that I was seriously deranged. And, uh, you know, I prayed and I picked up a Bible in the bathroom and it had all these verses in it about fools. And I said, wow, does that sound like me? And, but it also had a lot of verses about anger. 
Proverbs 19.19, 19, there's no point getting an angry man out of trouble. He's just going to get right back into it. Or Proverbs 16.32, mightier is the man who can control his temper than the man who can conquer a city. And verse after verse, chapter after chapter, they seemed like they were written for me. And while I remained in that bathroom for three hours, I came to an understanding that it was not a sign of strength to punch somebody or to kick down a door. It was a sign of weakness. It meant that you could be controlled by other people and by the environment. And I didn't want to be controlled. But I also came to understand that it was my selfishness. Because somebody was in my space, somebody was taking my thing, somebody was doing something to me. It was always about me and my and I. And I said, if you can step outside the center of the circle and let it be about somebody else, maybe that will change things. And I started trying that that day. And I've never had another angry outburst since that time. In America, the beautiful you write as a Bible believing Christian. You might imagine that I would not be a proponent of gay marriage. I believe God loves homosexuals as much as he loves everyone. But if we can redefine marriage as between two men or two women or any other based on social pressures as opposed to between a man and a woman, we will continue to redefine it in a way that we wish, which is a slippery slope with a disastrous ending. Correct. And, uh, and I stand completely by that. And that is, you know, marriage has been and always should be between a man and a woman. And if you begin to redefine it, and, you know, I was asked that question, and I said, I didn't think that, you, that gays could do that. And I mentioned a, a couple of other categories. The point being that there is no group now or in the future that should get the chance to redefine it. Because if they do, what keeps somebody else from coming along 20 years from now or 50 years from now and saying, well, we want to de redefine it. And what right do you then have to say, well, no, no, we're keeping it this way. You know, that doesn't make any sense. The easier thing to do, much easier thing to do, is to leave traditional definitions alone, but make whatever accommodations you need to make for other people. And, and what I've always said is any two adults of any sexual orientation should have the right to engage in a legal ceremony if they want, um, create legal documents which give them visitation rights, property rights, uh, whatever rights they would like to have. That can be crafted into the legal agreement. Leave marriage alone. You don't have to mess with marriage in order to do that. And that's what's really fair. If we take one group and say, you can change it, and you can change it for all of us, how is that fair? So what I'm talking about is treating everybody the same. Joe is in Hague, North Dakota. Joe, you're on Book TV. Please go ahead with your question or comment. Yeah, Dr. Carson, I'm sure honored to have the chance to talk to you. And uh, I is saw it, you talk there. Is it North Dakota good. that I hear? Yes. Yeah, North Dakota. That's the only uh, of the 50 states I have not visited. <laughs> well, you should come up here. We're, I'm a farmer rancher. I'm 75 years old. And the reason why I really enjoy your talks, I seen you or heard you that morning and the prayer breakfast, and I'm just glad that we have people like you with the backbone that stands up and just plainly talks truth, that you're pro-life and against gay marriage and all these things. And I just want to tell you a little about my history. We lost our dad when we was 10 years old. I had one brother who was nine months old. My mother was 34. We had three girls in between, and we stuck it out on the farm, which was my idea. I'm not complaining. I put out my first crop when I was 11, talking about working yourself up on the ladder. Today we buy cattle out of Montana, Nebraska, clear Texas, and all over the country. And the attitudes I hear from older people are exactly like yours. We know what the real rules are pertaining to, let's say, these gun laws. They wanted to take the guns away. Well, you know and I know, and we should anybody with a common mind knows, guns do not kill people. It's the people that kill people. All right, Joe, we got a lot of information there. Let's hear from Dr. Carson. Thanks for calling in. Well, I cer certainly appreciate uh, your hard work. And I'm sure that your hard work has resulted in a lot of opportunities for other people. 
And that's one of the things that I have emphasized uh, in these books, um, how we all have a, a role to play, how we work together, and how if we as Americans care about each other, we're going to have the kind of society that truly is fair. And you are watching Book TV's monthly in-depth program this month, surgeon and author, Dr. Ben Carson. Five books, one on the way. First book, Gifted Hands, the Ben Carson story, came out in 1990. Think Big, Unleashing Your Potential for Excellence in 96. The Big Picture came out in 2000. Take the Risk, Learning to Identify, Choose, and Live with Acceptable Risk in 2008. And his most recent, America the Beautiful, Rediscovering What Made This Nation Great. Dr. Carson, you mentioned earlier you're working on a new book. Yes, a new book uh, that uh, tentatively will be entitled One Nation. And again, I want to make sure that, that the people understand that we're not each other's enemies. We have to throw away this, this whole ideology that it has to be my way. I'm the only one who's right. As I said in uh, the National Prayer Breakfast, you know, the reason that the eagle can fly high and straight is because it has two wings, a left wing and a right wing. And when they work together, that eagle can fly extremely well. And if, if weighted down one way or the other way, you have problems. So people on the left and people on the right, we need to understand that we live here together. And in terms of the big issues, for the most part, we agree. I'm reminded of, of the movie Independence Day with Will Smith. And, uh, you know, the earth was suffering this uh, alien invasion. All of a sudden... The Arabs and the Israelis were working together. The Americans and the Russians were working together. You know, we need to start emphasizing those things that we have in common, working on those, and then we can deal with the other issues as they come along. You know, I liken it to a ship, that uh, a passenger ship that's about to go over Niagara Falls, and everybody's going to be killed. And you've got the crew and the passengers sitting there looking over the edge and saying, look at those barnacles down there. You know, we got to get those barnacles off the ship. I pay good money to go on this cruise. There's barnacles on the ship. Everybody's dead. <laughs> well, well, that begs the question that you ask in uh, America the Beautiful, the second ma major question. Um, can we learn from the mistakes of the past and not go the way of other pinnacle nations like Rome, et cetera? And, and, and certainly no one else has ever learned. Uh, so... You know, I couldn't argue vigorously against someone who said, no, we can't learn from it. We inexorably must tear ourselves apart and go over the cliff. But somehow I don't think it's true. I think there's something very different about this country than any of the other pinnacle countries that have ever come along. First of all, we are the child of every other nation. You know, we are mosaic of the world. So we should have the interest of all the other pieces of the world at heart because they really are our parents. Secondly, this is a country that was founded on godly principles. And I think that makes a big difference in terms of how you look at the world, how you treat people, how you treat other nations. And we need, rather than be ashamed of that, be proud of that. You know, Every coin in your pocket, every bill in your wallet says, in God we trust. But do we act like it? Oh, can't talk about God. Come on, that's schizophrenia. You know, people come along and they say, gee, I wonder if I should say Merry Christmas. Somebody might be offended. Give me a break. This is America. Freedom of speech, freedom of expression. It's a salutation of the season. It is not some... I hate you, and therefore I'm going to say this to irritate you. Come on. we got to stop letting people manipulate us and whip us into a frenzy. It was not an issue 50 years ago. It was the same people who were here 50 years ago. We just have to be a little more mature, and let's deal with the real problems and not the artificial ones. Next call for Dr. Carson comes from Bob in Livingston, Montana. Hi, Bob. <laughs> Bob, you're on the air. I guess I'm emotional listening to this guy. Uh, I just love the way he talks. Anyway, my question is, have you studied the Federal Reserve? To me, this is the 
the situation uh, that, that is bringing down America. I've been in the money business all my life, and I'm the age of Joe, North Dakota, and you can visit us first before that. <laughs> but the Federal Reserve has got control of the IRS. They're controlling everything. The, the fiat money is flooding all over the world. Every nation now, they got to have a central bank. And it's killing us because it's not based on supply and demand. Mm -hmm. It's just printing paper. Well, yes. Thank you. Yeah, yes, I have studied that, interestingly enough. A lot of people are really amazed at all the stuff that I've studied and read about. But I'm, I'm just a curious person. But, you know, when we kind of decoupled, you know, the dollar uh, from gold uh, during the uh, FDR years, uh, a lot of possibilities began to arise in terms of ways that currencies could be manipulated, uh, the ways that money could be printed and evaluated. Right now, uh, the name of the United States is the only thing that's really behind our currency. Um, and it does provide opportunities for manipulation. I think it's something that all of our, our legislators need to be aware of, need to understand. They need to understand its history and we need to understand the implications going into the future. And we need to be looking at ways that we can solidify the value of our currency and not devaluate it by continuing to print money. Dr. Ben Carson, John Wingate from Minneapolis uh, emails in, we live in a hyper-partisan era. If you were to run for president as a Republican, what changes in approach and message would you take to correct what you see as the party's errors of the past? Well, you know, first of all, I think, you know, both parties have plenty of errors. Uh, you know, I could talk about that for hours and hours. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. I just want to boil it down to, to one big issue. And both parties, again, have been guilty of this. This country was designed as a place for of and by the people. Now we are rapidly moving toward what the founders feared and that is a country that is for, of, and by the government. And as the government increases, it infringes upon the rights of the people. That is a natural consequence. And we are kind of allowing it to happen and kind of sticking our heads in the sand or in some cases not even noticing what's going on. And what I want to do is go back and look at the Constitution. I want us all to pay attention to the Constitution because it is an ingenious document. You know, it was the way it was put together. You know, it almost looked like things were not going to work out for our nation. There was so much discord. And the small states and the large states, everybody had different opinions about how things should be done and who had what rights. And before the thing broke apart, the elder statesman, Benjamin Franklin, stood up before the whole assembly. In 1787, he said, gentlemen, stop. He said, during the Revolutionary War, every other word out of your mouth was God save us. And he did. And now you don't even want to talk to him. And he said, let us get on our knees. And let us ask God for wisdom. And they knelt down and prayed. And they got up and they put together a 16 and one-third page document known as the Constitution of the United States. A greatly admired document that if we adhered to, we wouldn't be having nearly the problems that we have today. So if I were ever in that position, that document would once again become very important to us. 2008 book, Take the Risk, you write, in talking to people like George Lucas and A.G. Galston, I've come to the conclusion that the single most important determinant of the level of success a person achieves in any career is how he or she deals with the risks that career presents. Yes, well, you know, uh, there are people that, that I admire a lot. Uh, you know, George uh, Lucas you know, was his, his family was sort of in the retail business, and, you know, that's where his father intended for him to go. But, uh, you know, his heart was in film. And uh, he 
was really kind of living, <laughs> you know, hand to mouth. It was not a very pleasant situation for him. Um, and, you know, finally he got a break. Somebody said, I want you to direct, you know, this for me. I'll pay you $100,000. Uh, he said, no, I, I want to do my own thing. And, uh, you know, he got his big break with American Graffiti, and then along came some other things. He continued to do his own thing, his own way. He stuck to his guns and created an amazing empire and entertainment for millions of people throughout the world. Uh, A.G. Gaston, a black man in Birmingham, Alabama in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, became a multimillionaire. Now, you say, how in the world did that happen in the bastion of racism? Simple. I asked him when he was 95 years old. I had lunch with him. It was a great honor. I said, Mr. Gaston, how did you do that? And he said, it was simple. I opened my eyes. I looked around. I said, what do people need? And whatever it was, that's what I did. And he said, at that time, you know, a lot of the people were very concerned about what kind of funeral they would have. And, you know, a $600 funeral was considered, like, really top-of-the-line great funeral. So he started a funeral insurance business. He said to elderly people, give me a quarter a week, and I'll give you a $600 funeral. If you die tomorrow, if you gave me a quarter today, you get a $600 funeral. Everybody was giving him quarters. <laughs> he had so many quarters, he didn't know what to do with them. And, you know, he started a bank and a life insurance company, all kinds of stuff, and it just went on and on. And, you know, I, I've always thought that that was just such the coolest philosophy. You look around you, what do people need? That's what you do. You look at a lot of the great inventions that have occurred that have improved all of our lives. It was because somebody had that same attitude, and they did that. And that's what entrepreneurship that's what America is all about. We need to encourage that once again. And all of our policies should be directed at encouraging that, not at finding ways to take from this one and redistribute to this one. You know, that's just not where we are or where we should be as a nation. Edward, Modesto, California, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thanks for taking my call. Uh, Dr. Carson, it's an honor to talk to you. Um, my question is, um, I am an engineer. Uh, at the time when my wife became uh, ill uh, because of a, a heart problem, uh, she actually had a heart attack. Was not in uh, the, 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 She did not fit that bill, if you will, uh, and it was due to hereditary. The issue that we ran into was that I had to give up my, uh, my job in order to take care of my family. Um, we ended up paying COBRA, which was about $702 uh, a month at the time. This is early 2000. And when I tried looking at other insurance companies, uh, no one would touch her with a 10-foot pole for, because of a pre-existing condition. Uh, and we were, we were living in San Diego. I was even looking at geographically if we needed to move someplace else in order to have better insurance. The cheapest one I found was in Arizona, and it was $1,700 a month. Um, we're, we're middle income, you know, good salary and all that. So, Edward, the cost of insurance is what, what would you like the doctor to respond to? Well, the, the cost of insurance from the standpoint of the, the insurance companies, the the, uh, the, 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 the the medicines and things like that, that'll bankrupt middle America. Uh, no question about it. Uh, you know, we have rapidly escalating costs of medical care, and that was the impetus uh, behind Obamacare, that we could bring the price down. Uh, obviously, that has not worked. The price has gone up. But it doesn't mean that we shouldn't have been looking at this issue. You know, uh, one of the, the major pillars of the American health care system are insurance companies that make money by denying people care. That's, a, that's, that's fundamentally wrong. That's a conflict of interest. So I don't have any problem with insurance companies making a profit, but I think it should be, they should be nonprofit organizations. I don't think the idea of profiting on someone's health care in that manner, uh, when you don't have anything to do with their health care, really is fair. So uh, we need to address that. But I think, you know, rather than, you know, some people being gleeful as Obamacare is falling apart, 
you know, I think we should all be sad that that it does not appear to be the thing that's working. But, you know, let's not say, see, I told you so, or now this is the only way we can go and we just got to keep jamming it through. No, let's stop and be reasonable individuals. Let's say, have we learned some things from trying to implement this? Absolutely, we have learned some things. Are there things that we've known before? Absolutely. Can we work together? Can we look at some models that have worked? And can we apply those? Can we use our collective intellect to actually solve the problem rather than making it into a political football? You know, uh, I talked about, again, at the National Prayer Breakfast, a system that I believe would work extremely well, health savings accounts. Now, you know, the current plan, you can only put like $2,500 into you know, a medical savings account, you know, that's a drop in a bucket. That That's not meaningful. Um, but with a real health savings account, similar to uh, sort of the medical savings account system that they have in Singapore, which is contributed to throughout your lifetime, you can accumulate quite a significant amount of money. Even the indigent people, the amount of money that we give them for Medicaid, if it's divvied up and put into their HSAs, uh, would give them quite a healthy account over the course of time. And uh, in some places in the world, uh, like Singapore, you can actually transfer money. Like, let's say a husband needs a heart transplant, and it's going to cost 80000 and he only has 75000 in this account. His wife can give the other 5000 or his son or his daughter or his mother or father. Every family becomes like a little mini insurance company in and of themselves. Uh, their cost per capita is less than a quarter of what ours is. And if you go and you talk to them, you'll find they're very happy. They can also, with their health savings account, buy catastrophic insurance, buy bridge insurance. We would be able to do the same thing. We need to be able to, to look at these kinds of things. I think if we stop making it a partisan issue and actually say, let's fix this for the American people, we can do this. We absolutely can. Dr. Carson, in your book, America the Beautiful, in the chapter, Is Healthcare a Right? You ask, you, or you write this, today, to a large extent, insurance companies call the shots on what they want to pay, to whom, and when. Consequently, even busy doctors operate with a very slim profit margin and find it much more difficult to offer care to the poor and pay for it out of their profit. I speak from personal experience because over the last many years, I've had to cut my staff significantly due to low insurance company reimbursements. Yes. And interestingly enough, you know, when I first started practicing medicine and, you know, it would come to my attention that there was a kid somewhere who had some horrible tumor or some cranial facial problem, you know, from this country or someplace else in the world. And, uh, you know, I'd look at the case and I'd say, we can help this person. And I'd say, let's just override the cost. And nobody ever said boo. They were happy to do it. Everybody was happy to donate their services. It was never an issue. Never. I can't remember a single time. Um, but then over the course of the years, as the budget started tightening, as the insurance companies began to be able to pay whatever, only what they wanted to pay, uh, the profit margin shrunk to the point where the, the hospital would go out of business if they continued to operate in that way. And I totally understand that and don't blame them at all. Um, but... We need to recognize that, you know, most people who go into medicine are very generous people. You know, years ago, you know, most practitioners, you know, 5, 10, 15 percent of their populace were indigent people who couldn't pay. They took care of them anyway because, you know, they had enough cushion and they're good people and they want to care for people. That's the reason that they go into medicine. And we need to stop uh, finding ways to demonize and penalize them and finding ways to make, you know, you know, life more tolerable for them and easy for them to practice their humanitarian crafts. Andrew in Saline, Michigan, thanks for holding. You're on with Dr. Ben Carson. Yes, Dr. Carson, have you ever faced discrimination from within the black community for being successful? And if so, how have you dealt with that? And go blue, I'll listen off the phone. <laughs> okay. Um, well, certainly... Um, there have been people in the black community, uh, particularly uh, in the media, uh, who have been critical of me. You know, they say, 
<laughs> I remember one one guy saying, you know, he's an Uncle Tom. Well, uh, I don't get into that slime pit, but I did just mention to him, I wonder if you know what that term actually means. Because Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe, uh, Uncle Tom was a sort of go-along to get-along character, sort of doing the song and dance. He was not challenging anybody. And uh, that's exactly the opposite of what I'm doing. So I recommend it to him that he go back and actually read the, the story before he starts uh, accusing people of things and, and he doesn't know what he's talking about. But that's usually about as negative as I will get on people. From the big picture, you write, many black people harbor racist feelings toward whites. While most black racism I have witnessed is what I would term reactionary, an angry response to the discrimination they have experienced themselves, it is no less hideous and no less destructive than any other variation of this plague on our society. Absolutely. You know, racism, regardless of where it comes from, is evil. And, you know, we, we like to just sort of pick one group and say that they're the racists. But, you know, I think anybody who looks at me and says, oh, he's a black man, so this is what he should be thinking. This is what he should be saying. I think they're a racist, you know, whether they're conservative or whether they're liberal. I think they're a racist. You know, I'm an individual. And, uh, you know, uh, I was giving an interview on NPR once, and the, and the interviewer said, Dr. Carson, I notice you don't speak about race very often. Why is that? And I said, it's because I'm a neurosurgeon. And she looked at me quizzically, thinking, what the heck does that have to do with it? And I said, you see, when I take someone to the operating room and I cut that scalp and peel it down and take off that bone flap and open the dura, I'm operating on the thing that makes that person who they are. The cover doesn't make them who they are. It really doesn't have a whole lot to do with what they are. And only those people who are very superficial let the cover define the person. Those people who are deep look at the content of the character, as Martin Luther King said. Dr. Carson, eighth grade, who was Mr. Mann? Uh, Mr. Mann was the uh, band teacher. And uh, I tell the story of how, you know, I had turned things around. When I was in the fifth grade, I was the dummy. When I was in the seventh grade, I got to the top of the class, still at the top of the class in the eighth. Same kids that I'd been with in the fifth grade, there in the eighth grade, and they had seen the transition. They were very impressed, and they accepted it. Um, there was a, a special award that was given to the student who had the highest academic performance. And, uh, you know, I was the only, only black student in the eighth grade. Um, and you would take your report card around to the teachers, <laughs> and they would put your grade on it. And uh, band was the last class, and I had all A's. And I was going to be a cinch to be the top student. And Mr. Mann gave me a C. Even though I was a terrific student in being, he, I mean, he clearly just wanted to keep me from getting the top award. Well, much to his consternation, it turned out that Ben was not counted. <laughs> so I still got the top award. And um, interestingly, and of course this scene is depicted in the movie also, uh, when I was presented with the top award, there was one of the teachers uh, who got up and chastised the other students. I mean, how could all of these white students allow a black student to be number one? Now, recognize this was, you know, a long time ago, 50 years plus ago. And, you know, people were ignorant, you know. And, and there were a lot of people who, who just didn't even think that a black person could possibly intellectually be the equal of a white person. Um, and, and I don't say that that was necessarily because they were evil. I'm saying that that was the culture they were brought up in. That's what they knew. That's what they thought. And um, I then took it upon myself as my own issue to educate people. And I was always shocking people because, you know, they would mention something and, you know, this 15-year-old come along and wax eloquently on the subject, and they'd be saying, what <laughs> is going on? I enjoyed shocking people like that. But, um, but the fact of the matter is, uh, you know, discriminatory practices are based on ignorance. That's all it is. 
And that's why it's important to educate people. And as people become educated, the more educated they are, the less superficial they are. And in Gifted Hands, you also talk about being a, a resident at Johns Hopkins and being mistaken for an orderly. Yes, when I first came uh, back in 1977, you know, uh, black doctors were extraordinarily rare. And there had certainly never been one in the neurosurgery service. So when I would go on the wards and I would have scrubs on, invariably one of the nurses would mistake me for an orderly. Say, I'm sorry, Mr. Smith isn't ready to be taken to the operating room. And uh, I would say, well, gee, I'm, I'm sorry he's not ready. I'm Dr. Carson, and I'm from the neurosurgery service. And they turned about 18 shades of red. And I said, you don't need to be embarrassed. It's okay. It's fine. I'd be very nice to them, and I would have a friend for life um, because they very much appreciated my attitude on that. But the, the reason my attitude was that way is because, you know, I looked at the big picture. I said, from the perspective of this nurse, the only black man to ever come in this ward with scrubs on was an orderly. So why would she think something different? Now, if they do it the second time, I might have a few words, choice words for them. <laughs> Did you ever have patients refuse your service? Yes. Uh, again, uh, when I first came to Hopkins, uh, there were patients who did not want their care by a black physician. And uh, the chairman of our department, Donlin Long, who has a Quaker background, uh, would always tell them the same thing. Uh, Dr. Carson is a prized resident. We chose him from among many. And if you're going to be in this hospital, he's going to be involved in your care. And if you don't like that, the door is right over there. <laughs> it was very consistent with that message. And it turned out not to be a big problem because he was consistent with that message. Monique in Houston, thanks for holding. You're on Book TV on C-SPAN 2 with Dr. Ben Carson. Yes, hi, Dr. Carson. Hi. It's, just, it's an honor to talk with you today. Um, I have a question. Um, I have a spinal muscular atrophy. Uh, I'm 40 years old, and I also have an older sister with the same disease. And I was wondering um, if you know if, if there's been any advances in the uh, in the scientific research in finding a cure for spinal muscular atrophy or any other uh, type of muscular dystrophy. Okay. Well, that, that would be a question that would be better directed to a neurologist who specializes in those areas. I will tell you that there is uh, some significant research going on in terms of how to use electronic uh, apparatuses uh, to stimulate and to and utilizing those along with brain waves to help activate limbs that are not atrophic or contracted. And, and therefore, it's very important to try to keep your limbs in very good shape because that kind of technology is advancing. Uh, will we at some point be able to control the way that stem cells work and be able to, to reinvigorate the, you know, portions of the ner nervous and muscular system? I suspect the answer to that is yes. So, um, but, but I would uh, definitely defer to a neurologist who is an expert in that area. Dr. Carson, are you teaching at all? Do you have any connection with Hopkins still? Uh, yes, I'm uh, an emeritus professor. And uh, yes, I, I still am on the uh, schedule of teaching. And, you know, I, uh, I have warm feelings uh, toward Johns Hopkins. You know, some people say, well, you must hate Hopkins uh, because of the commencement situation. Uh, I don't. Uh, the, uh, the decision to withdraw as the commencement speaker was my own decision. Uh, no one asked me to do it. Um, but, you know, I thought that the graduation really should be about the students and not about me, and it would have been a circus. So why put anybody through that? I know uh, I got so many emails from my colleagues and staff uh, approaching a thousand of support, how much they appreciate it, what I've done, how much they enjoy it working with me. Um, most of them probably would not be public about it because, you know, there are people who are fearful. Some of the students, some of the medical students sent me emails saying that they were fearful to show outward support because they thought that they might be penalized. I don't think the administration would do that. I really don't. But 
the fact that, that people actually have that fear is concerning to me and something that we probably should uh, concentrate on. For people who don't know, what is a commencement situation? Uh, well, you know, I was asked to, uh, to give the commencement address uh, at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine this year and also the School of Education. Uh, and um, because of the uh, situation with gay marriage and my definition as that between a man and a woman, uh, some of the media that doesn't particularly like my stances tried to say that I was comparing gay marriage to bestiality, which I was, of course, not. But they knew that if they could paint me that way, it would demonize me. And, uh, you know, that took root with uh, a few students, and they created, you know, some uh, turmoil and, and protest. Uh, anybody, again, as I say, who knows me, knows that, you know, there's not a homophobic bone in my body. You know, but what I do care about is freedom and justice for everybody. And I do have principles and standards which I hold. Um, and uh, they, I will readily admit, uh, derive from uh, my belief uh, in God. And, you know, I'm not apologetic about that. Uh, but at the same time, I do make it clear that what I try to exercise is real tolerance. So even though, you know, I'm, I'm not an advocate of gay marriage, I have no objection whatsoever to uh, gay people or, or other people or anybody, quite frankly, doesn't want to be engaged in a traditional marriage, but they do want to, to have a close association. They do want to have uh, many of the benefits associated with marriage. I don't have a problem with that. And, uh, and, and you know, sometimes people just cannot get their head around the fact that unless you totally agree with the way that I want it, then you're this or that. And, you know, the, the example that I frequently use is I say, you know, uh, a lot of the people who, who advocate gay marriage are like a new group of mathematicians who come along and say two plus two is five. And the traditional mathematicians say, no, it's four, it's always been four. And the new ones say, no, it's five. We insist it's five. And so the old ones say, okay, for you it can be five, we're keeping it as four. And the new ones say, nope, it has to be five for you too. And if it's not five for you, then you're a mathist. You know, and, you know, th this kind of intolerance, I think, is something that we need to get rid of. Uh, and we need to treat everybody equally. Well, recently, uh, Tanya Davis, who is the producer of this program, uh, visited Dr. Carson at his house in suburban Baltimore to learn how he writes and where he writes. And here's a little bit of that. Most people don't really understand, you know, how it works with books. A, a, a lot of people write books and then they spend the next two years trying to get somebody to publish their books. I've, I've never really experienced that. So when people come to me and say, how do you get a book published? I say, look, <laughs> yeah, I'm the wrong person to ask. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I finally felt that, that really I had something to say. I don't write books just for the purpose of writing books. The first three four books, actually, uh, I did with a co-writer. And uh, basically I would sometimes dictate them to a, a tape recorder and then send them the tapes and then they would, uh, you know, transcribe things. Um, Audrey, this is this last book I did myself with my wife. Uh, you know, she did a lot of the research and, you know, help with the editing and of course she's quick to point out it's the first one that hit number one on the New York Times bestseller list. <laughs> uh, but actually I, I enjoy very much uh, working with my wife so uh, certainly I'll be doing that uh, from now on. Uh, fortunately it does tend to come pretty easily. Uh, it's very much like speaking. Uh, when I give a, a speech, you know, I don't have a written text. I just go up there and, you know, I survey the situation, I ascertain what kind of audience we have, 
And, uh, you know, I'll have a few points that I want to make sure that I make, which I might have written on a card. And I just start speaking. Basically, I write the same way. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll have a chapter title, and I'll write down some bullet points about what I want to say, and I'll order them. And I just start dictating. Okay. And uh, so it's, it's very much, you know, what's on my heart. You know, I always pray and I ask God to guide me uh, in my writing, to give me wisdom in terms of what points need to be brought out. And uh, I think he does a pretty good job of that. Dr. Ben Carson, who is Lucina Rustin? Uh, that happens to be my wife of 38 years. <laughs> Most people know her as Candy. And, uh, you know, we uh, met at Yale. We actually uh, were recruiting for Yale in Detroit. It was a way that we could get to come home for Thanksgiving because neither one, neither one of us had enough money to do that, and they would pay for a trip back home. And, uh, and while we were recruiting, we came to recognize that we really did like each other quite a bit. And uh, interestingly enough, when we were on our way back to school, um, we were in a rental car and we had to get it back the next morning. Uh, and we were driving from Ann Arbor, Michigan to New Haven, Connecticut. And we were just going to drive all night. And uh, you know, she fell asleep and then I fell asleep at the wheel going 90 miles an hour on Interstate 80 in Youngstown, Ohio, and I was awakened uh, by the vibration as the car was going off the road, heading for a ravine, and, uh, you know, I just grabbed the wheel and spun it, and the car actually started spinning like a top, and they say your life passes before your eyes before you die. I vividly remember it. It was like a movie just rapidly going through, and I said, I'm going to die, and the car stopped in the lane uh, next to the shoulder and uh, just in time to pull off before an 18-wheeler came barreling through and you know of course Candy was awake by that time and you know we we started talking and we said you know what the Lord spared our lives for a reason and he's got something special for us to do and that was the night we started going together 202 is the area code if you'd like to dial in and participate in our conversation with author and neurosurgeon Dr. Ben Carson, 585-3880. For those of you in the East and Central time zones, 585-3881. If you live in the Mountain and Pacific time zones, at Book TV is our Twitter handle. If you can't get through on the phone lines, you can also make a comment on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash book TV or an email, booktv at cspan.org. Dr. Carson is the author of five books beginning in 1990. His autobiography, Gifted Hands, The Ben Carson Story, came out. Think Big, Unleashing Your Potential for Excellence, came out in 1996. The Big Picture came out in 2000. Take the Risk, Learning to Identify, Choose and Live with Acceptable Risk, came out in 2008. And America the Beautiful, Rediscovering What Made This Nation Great, came out in 2011. Mike in Albuquerque, New Mexico, you have been very patient. Please go ahead with your question or comment for Dr. Carson. Hey, Dr. Carson. Um, I was advised by a VA hospital chaplain not to talk about my sexual orientation with doctors and nurses at the VA. 
because a lot of the employees at the VA are very conservative, and I would not receive the same level of care because of homophobia. Do you think homophobia is a real thing in the medical profession and in society? Well, I think certainly it, it has been in the past. I think uh, as people have gotten to know uh, people uh, who are gay, uh, and in many cases didn't know that they were gay at first, and recognized that they're uh, regular people. You know, I have worked with, hired, <laughs> dealt with uh, gay people for years, uh, and you know, there's absolutely no reason I would tell anybody to be homophobic. Um, at the same time, I would also say to those in the gay community, don't assume that someone is homophobic just because they be believe in traditional marriage. I think that is a real stretch and probably not a fair assessment. Next call is Tom in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Tom, you're on Book TV on C-SPAN 2. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Carson, would you please explain to your audience why you repeatedly use the term uh, secular progressive? Uh, my wife and I are progressives, uh, but our religion informs every political and social belief and, and thing we do. So why do you constantly use that term? Okay. Thanks very much. All right. Well, first of all, uh, if you uh, are, in fact, a believer in God, then you're not a secular progressive. Uh, you may be a progressive, uh, but you're not a secular progressive. Uh, and secular progressives, the way I use that term, are people who tend not to believe in God and whose social views are informed by their non-belief and their substitution of their own code of ethics. Wayne, Bakersfield, California. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thanks for taking my call, Dr. Carson. You had mentioned earlier about you had mentioned earlier about the fact that if uh, you ran for or became president, you would get back to the basics of the U.S. Constitution. And I was wondering how we got away from all of that in, in the first place. Is it, is it something we did by not being more involved with our government? Or is our government in kind of in reality taking on a life of its own yeah. and really not paying attention to what the Constitution really means and, and stands for? Thanks for my call. Okay. Well, I think uh, both of those things are, are true. Uh, we have not been vigilant. And uh, you have to recognize that, that freedom is not something that's thrust upon you. It's something that you have to seek and something that you have to maintain. The natural order of things is that governments grow. They expand. They take on a life of their own. You know, the founders of this country warned us severely against that. And they tried to put in place a constitution that would restrain the growth of government. But we actually have allowed people in all three branches of our government to ignore the constitution. And they see no consequences for doing that. We the people are the ultimate authority. They work for us. But if we neglect our responsibilities, then they can do anything they want to do. We need to wake up. We need to know what the voting records are of our representatives. And particularly, you know, people in the executive branch of government, we need to hold them responsible. And if we don't do it, they will simply take liberties. The other thing that's interesting is one of the real pillars of a strong democratic society and a free society is a free press and a free press that is free of bias that will report things fairly on either side this seems to be something that is being lost in our society and if the press takes sides doesn't really 
investigate what one side is doing, but totally castigates the other side, what it does is it empowers the side that they're taking to begin to disregard a lot of the portions of the Constitution and to take on their own mantra of authority. And that, in the long run, is detrimental to all of us. And it's my hope and prayer that the press in our nation will come to its senses soon and recognize that if the whole nation goes off the cliff, they're going off too. And I know a lot of those guys, and they're pretty smart. And I think they actually will actually come to that realization. The question will be, will it be in time? Rosiner Branyan emails in to you, Dr. Carson. Are any of your sons also doctors? Uh, I have three sons. Uh, my oldest son, Murray, is an engineer, uh, specializes in nanotechnology. My middle son, uh, Benjamin Jr., uh, lives in the financial world. He's uh, vice president of a financial firm, does a lot of investment banking, uh, and is networked everywhere. And, uh, and my youngest son, Royce, is an accountant. And I have one granddaughter, Tesora, who's the cutest little thing that you could ever imagine. She was born on, on, leap, year, on leap Day last year. And uh, the way I understand that it works is they have a birthday every year until they're 30, and then it's once every fourth year after that. <laughs> Where was Ben Carson Jr. born? Uh, ben Carson Jr., or BJ as we call him, was born at home. Uh, it was not intended that way, but uh, you know, my, my wife had been in a, a marathon that day, but she only walked. Other people were running. But, uh, uh, but she also uh, took some poke salad that day. My mother had made some greens with some poke salad in it. Uh, unbeknownst to us at that time, uh, poke salad has an ingredient in it that midwives used to use to induce labor. <laughs> so about two in the morning, you know, my wife awakened me and said, the baby's coming. And I said, uh, it, it doesn't work that way. I said, see, what happens is <laughs> you start having contractions 10 minutes apart, and then five minutes, and then two minutes, and then we call the hospital. And she said, I understand all that, but the baby's coming. <laughs> I, I looked, and the baby was crowning. <laughs> so we had to deliver uh, the baby at home. And uh, he's been in a hurry ever since then. Randall's in Seminole, Florida. Hi, Randall. Hi, how you doing? It's an honor to speak with you, Dr. Carson. Thank you. Um, thank you for all the young lives you've saved in the operating room as well as the ones you continue to save with all your uh, inspiration to others. Um, I had the honor and pleasure of meeting you. Uh, it had to be at least 15 years ago in Orlando, Florida at a black-on-black -black crime seminar. And uh, I, I remember almost everything you said on that day. I remember you talking about touring a tennis shoe factory. I believe it was in Vietnam and how you uh, dissected the tennis shoes because one was priced at a very high rate and the others were priced much cheaper and that they were identical on the inside. And I was quite impressed with that. Randall, why were you at a black-on-black -black seminar, crime seminar? I was a police officer for 27 years. I was a community police officer in a uh, predominantly African-American community at the time. And uh, I went there for training. Um, that was probably one of, the, one of the greatest and most honorable positions I ever held in law enforcement was to be actually part of the community as opposed to just going in and enforcing laws. Uh, we um, started quite a few programs helping out the youth, uh, cleaning up the, uh, the neighborhood, taking uh, what their concerns were and trying to solve them as best we could. Wonderful. So, Randall, how close are you to Sanford, Florida? Uh, that's quite a distance. You know where Tampa Bay is, yep. St. Petersburg? Yep. Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm one city next to St. Petersburg. So I, I, I take it you're white? I am. Okay. What's your take on the, the Zimmerman, Trayvon Martin case? I, uh, quite honestly, I think it was kind of sad the way that uh, he, uh, Mr. Zimmerman was treated. Um, he did what we ask of almost all of our citizens, whether they're black, white, or of any race is to take your head out of the sand and pay attention to what's going on in your community. I think he saw something that looked suspicious to him. I think he did what he thought was right. And um, 
it's just unfortunate the outcome. I think that uh, had some of the other citizens in that community gotten involved, that were looking out their windows seeing what was happening, uh, had they just stepped outside and, and simply yelled, the police are on the way, I believe that uh, Mr. Zimmerman would not have been beaten, and I think Trayvon would still be alive. Um, Dr. Carson, you recently wrote an op-ed in the Washington Times about this case. Yeah, uh, you know, my point uh, about that op-ed uh, was that, you know, some people are calling for boycotting Florida uh, because of the outcome of the Zimmerman trial. They were not satisfied with the verdict and that, in fact, the use of boycotts should not be taken lightly. And I talked a little bit about the history of boycotts with the Montgomery bus boycott, how effective it can be, but, you know, not to throw that term around loosely. But I also uh, talked about the fact that, you know, uh, people and neighborhood watch, I and mean, we, we should be learning everything we can from this situation. And neighborhood watches can be really quite useful uh, when they're, uh, used in conjunction with the police and when they are well trained by the police. I think in the case, uh, in the Trayvon Martin Zimmerman case, uh, there probably was more training that could have been done because uh, what happens and what I've known as a youngster growing up in the, in the ghetto is that when somebody starts following you <laughs> at nighttime, uh, you know, that's usually a serious situation and you go into fight or flight mode and, and and then you know they're right up on you and you know you make that the choice um, and what most policemen will tell people in a neighborhood watch is that you you don't actually approach an individual uh, you yell out to them and say who you are and then ask them who they are and what they're doing there from a distance and most of the time, the answer will be quite satisfactory, but if it isn't, uh, then, of course, you call the police. And uh, that, perhaps, if we can make sure that Neighborhood Watch people know that throughout the, the nation, uh, we can avoid this kind of situation from occurring again. So let's always learn from the situation. Uh, if, if either Mr. Zimmerman or uh, uh, Mr. Martin had sort of back down or perhaps had, you know, less of a confrontational stance, I don't think we would have been looking at this tragedy. Uh, having said, and the other, other point that I made is that, you know, knowing that this case was going to be highly scrutinized and very controversial, I think it would have been wise for the legal counsels on both sides to perhaps try to create a little more diversity in the jury. This is not to say that the jury came up with the wrong verdict at all, but you have to be concerned about optics and about the feelings of people throughout your community. All of these things are important, and there's, there's a way to do it, which I think uh, works better for everybody. In several of your books, Dr. Carson, you talk about, uh, or you mention Jesse Jackson, Reverend Jackson. Do you have a relationship with him? Uh, well, certainly, uh, I've, I've met him. Uh, and I think a lot of the things that, uh, that he stood for uh, years ago uh, when he was working with Dr. King uh, were extremely uh, admirable things, and I think uh, he has certainly made a contribution. Um, April 1968, you were in high school, the day Martin Luther King was shot, what happened? Well, you know, that day is still so vivid in my memory. Um, students, the black students, were just incredibly angry. And uh, many of them were going around in groups uh, looking for any white person they could find and just beating the tar out of them. And, uh, you know, I was very concerned. And I happened to be the, the lab assistant, biology lab assistant. And I had a key to the lab, so, you know, I was getting white students into the lab and locking the lab so that they could hide until the whole thing was over. Um, you know, I was very disappointed and angry, too, that Dr. King had been killed. You know, I, uh, as a teenager, followed what was going on with the Civil Rights Movement with uh, great interest. Um, but 
in no way was I at a point where I was ready to blame <laughs> all white people for that. Um, and, and I think that just uh, maybe demonstrated uh, the Christianity part of me. You know, I, I recognize that, that Christ died for everybody. God loves us all. And, uh, you know, to try to lump people into categories based on superficial uh, qualities is really the height of irresponsibility. Yolanda is calling from here in the suburbs, Upper Marlboro, Maryland. Hi, y Yolanda. How are you? Thank you for listening, Dr. Carson. Absolutely. Uh, I greatly admire your courage in speaking out for nothing more except about speaking about what is important to an individual. And I agree with you about not being a respecter of persons when it comes to one's conscience. So uh, I believe all persons deserve to be respected for their honesty, whether they agree with me or not. So my question is, um, it's not necessary for me to know what your future plans are, but what is your <clears throat> next step in protecting people's rights and how can I support you? All right. Well, thank you. Um, right now, you know, I'm, I'm writing books. Uh, I'm doing an incredible amount of public speaking, probably too much. Um, you know, I'm working with our scholarship program. Uh, we're in all 50 states now. Uh, basically, we try to take uh, children from all backgrounds who achieve at the highest academic levels and also demonstrate humanitarian qualities. They have to have both components. We don't want people who are just smart and don't care about somebody else. And we put them on the same kind of pedestal as we do the all-state basketball players and the all-state wrestlers. Because I don't have anything against sports and entertainment, don't get me wrong. But what will maintain the position of our country? The ability to shoot a 25-foot jump shot or the ability to solve a quadratic equation? So we've got to maybe try to prioritize, and that's the purpose of that. And uh, we also put in reading rooms all over the country, and we particularly target Title I schools, where a lot of kids come from homes with no books. They go to a school with no library. They're not going to learn to love reading. Those are the ones who frequently drop out. We can't afford that. You know, this is the uh, information age, the technological age. We cannot afford to lose any of our students. So we've got to figure out ways to really work with them and put the dollars where they really count and, uh, and make a huge difference. So doing that um, and continue with, with some uh, academic pursuits and, uh, you know, doing a fair amount of uh, appearances on television. Uh, but, you know, largely what I'm trying to do is, is, is help to change the dynamics in our country and get away from all of this hatred and spite and help people to recognize that we're not each other's enemies and that if we learn how to work together, there's amazing things that we can accomplish. Have you been approached to run for office? <laughs> Many times. Uh, a lot of people feel that, but that that's in my future. Uh, my personal opinion is that uh, you know I can do a lot of good outside of the political arena. Uh, politically, I'm an independent. Uh, I have a lot of friends that are Republicans. I have a lot of friends that are Democrats. To me, the R or the D doesn't matter. I really would like to de-emphasize that and really start talking about the problems that we have. Well, uh, Tony Hall from South Lake Tahoe, California emails in, I am a teacher in a court-mandated high school inside a juvenile, juvenile hall. I know that you had a tough childhood. What words or advice would you have for my students? A very good question, and, and thank you. Thank you for your service and working with those young people. And uh, the police officer who called before, thank you. You know, I... Uh, Teachers and police officers are some of my favorite people, along with nurses, uh, and they do great service and uh, frequently are not recognized. Now, and by the way, as long as I'm being nice to everybody, <laughs> happy birthday, Mr. President. Is that President Clinton, President Obama's birthday today. He's 52. Um, those students, here's what I would say. The average person today lives to be about years old in this country. The first 20 to 25 years, you spend either preparing yourself or not preparing yourself. 
If you prepare yourself, you have 60 years to reap the benefits. And if you don't prepare yourself, you have 60 years to suffer the consequences. Now is the time when you are making that decision. You are the only one who gets to do it. You get to choose your future. Laura tweets in, a friend of hers daughter got a Ben Carson scholarship and it was great, really special. What is a Ben Carson scholarship? Well, uh, first of all, congratulations to that young lady because it is very hard to win. <laughs> you got to be really smart. Um, but it's, it's what I was talking about, you know, our scholarship program, we're in all 50 states. And um, we acknowledge, it's really more of a recognition program for students starting in the fourth grade. They have to have at least a 3.75 grade point average on a 4.0 scale to even be considered. Most of them have 4.0s or better. And they have to have sustained demonstration that they care about other people. It can't be just the six weeks before the, the application is due. And uh, they get money that's put uh, into um, a, a system where they can see each year how much is growing. And when they go off to college, they get the money and interest. The school gets a trophy every bit as impressive as any of the sports trophies. It goes right out there with the sports trophies with their name on it. Um, they get a special medal to wear. They get to go to a banquet. We frequently have uh, adult role models at these banquets. Uh, in incredibly impressive individuals that uh, everybody would know uh, as people that they should try to emulate. And, um, and now we're in the process of trying to network these young people uh, across the nation so that they actually know each other. And can you imagine the effect in 10 years when there's 100,000 incredibly smart young people who care about other people and uh, are networked together? You know, but I want us to, to get our country moving in the right way even before that. And I think we have the possibility of doing that. Dilip Patel from Columbia, Maryland emails in to you. Dr. Carson, why did America elect Obama twice? Is it good for the country or not? Well, you know, that's obviously a, a very f philosophical question. Something you discuss in America the Beautiful. I do. Um, first of all, I will say that in 2008, the things that the president was saying were very attractive uh, to anyone. You know, we're going to sort of get rid of all this partisanship. We're going to have uh, transparency. We're going to get rid of all these special interest groups. I said, you know, that guy sounds really, really good. Uh, obviously, none of those things happened. Uh, but you can certainly understand why the first election took place. Uh, the second election, um, I think it was a, a matter of people thinking that, well, yeah, he didn't do that great a job, but... I'm not sure I like this other guy either. And, uh, you know, so it's sort of like half a dozen one way, six the other way. And uh, I, I don't think that they really felt that, that things would, would change that much either way. Couple that with an extraordinary campaign, campaign staff, campaign mechanism, uh, an extremely articulate and... Uh, compelling speaker. And then you also have to recognize that a lot of people in America today just have not informed themselves to the degree that they should. And the, the founders of our nation said the kind of America that we're looking for and to create is based upon a well-informed and well-educated populace. If the populace ever becomes less than that, the nature of the nation will change because people will decide what they believe based on what pundits say and based 
on what a candidate says rather than on what they do. And, uh, you know, this is a problem, again, on both sides. I'm not saying that one side is any better than the other side. But what I am saying is we the people have to be responsible. We have to know what we're doing. When you go in that voting booth, don't just look for the name that looks familiar. Don't just look for the D or the R. Make sure you know what you're doing. And, you know, there, you know, there were a lot of people who wanted me to run for the Senate in Maryland against Senator Ben Cardin, who I know. Um, but can you imagine how confusing that would have been for voters? Ben Carson, Ben Cardin. <laughs> I can't tell you how many people come up to me now and say, Hi, Dr. Cardin. I'm sure they come up to him and say, Hi, Senator Carson. You know, we just, ha we just have to be a little more with the game than that. Gifted Hands was Dr. Carson's first book, The Ben Carson Story. It came out in 1990. Think Big, Unleashing Your Potential for Excellence came out in 96. The Big Picture came out in 2000. Taking the Risk, Learning to Identify, Choose, and Live with Acceptable Risk, 2008. America the Beautiful, Rediscovering What Made This Nation Great, 2011. And a new one on the way, One Nation. When, yes. do, when should we see that? That should be out early in 2014. And w your publisher has always been Zondervan. What is Zondervan? Uh, Zondervan is the um, religious branch of HarperCollins. Uh, the publisher for the new book will be Penguin. Why? Um, I just thought that there was uh, an opportunity to reach a different uh, audience. George in Miami, please go ahead with your question or comment for Dr. Yeah. Ben Carson. Yes, Dr. Carson, it's, it's a pleasure to listen to you. Um, I was a young man growing up in Brooklyn when uh, Martin Luther King was killed, and I remember quite vividly that uh, the young man, the Italian boy that lived next door to me, was chased home by a gang of, of black youths, and uh, he rushed inside of his house right next door, and they threw a garbage can through the window. Next thing I knew, um, his, him and his father came out with shotguns, and they started firing in the air. Everybody scattered, so these guys left, and uh, that was it. But uh, getting back to uh, Florida, I'm in Miami now, and uh, when you were talking about Trayvon Martin, I personally think uh, he got away with murder. My father is black. My mother's white, and I don't love either one of them more or less than the other. Um, so I don't think uh, you could uh, call the police and have them uh, tell you not to follow someone, and you follow them anyway and uh, shoot them in the heart and then claim self-defense. Anyway, uh, Dr. Carson, uh, like I said, I moved down to uh, Miami in 1987. I came down with uh, spinal meningitis, and I had uh, that same year that I came down uh, to Miami in 87, and I had brain surgery. I was in the hospital for three months. I had craniotomy. Hey, George, uh, we're, we're a little tight on time. What, what would you like the doctor to respond to? Well, um, it was just uh, about the craniotomy and the cranioplasty, and, uh, and I wanted to uh, um, ask him, my mother's 82 years old, uh, and she has Alzheimer's. That, does that have any effect, increase or decrease my chances of Alzheimer's or stroke? Thank and, you, George. Uh, I think we got a lot of information there. Yeah, Dr. Well, Carson? Um, <clears throat> there, there are many who feel that there is a, a hereditary uh, predisposition uh, for Alzheimer's. I think there's a lot of research going on in that area, and progress is being made. You know, my mother, too, has uh, Alzheimer's, so I, I certainly uh, sympathize, uh, and I hope there's not a huge <laughs> hereditary component. Uh, but, uh, you know, you have to recognize that uh, there, there's good things and bad things to be taken out of that. You know, there, at the last turn of the century, you know, the average American only lived to be, you know, 47 to 49 years old. And now we're looking at 80. So Alzheimer's could potentially have been an issue back then. It's just that most people never really got to that age. 
So in a way, it's, it's sort of a, a badge of progress, but at the same time, uh, a lot of scientists are working very hard on this. Uh, you know, having spent my whole career in medicine, you know, I am acquainted with uh, people who are just beyond belief smart uh, and are coming up with all kinds of things every day. So to me, I'm very encouraged. Rob, Seattle, Washington, good afternoon to you. Hi, hello. I'm, uh, first, I wanted to thank you very much for the inspiration you have provided so many people in the United States mm -hmm. and uh, throughout the world. Um, I believe that one of the greatest presidents we had was Ronald Reagan. And one of the reasons was because he inspired, but he also had a very pragmatic way of looking at things. And I think that you have many of those qualities, and I would really like you to encourage you to think about the presidency of the United States. I think uh, the only other person I see with the same balance is Marco Rubio, and I think he is another great leader. And uh, I'll take your comments off the air. Okay. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much. I, as I've said before, if I had a nickel for... Everybody who thought I should run for president, I could finance my campaign. <laughs> but uh, as I've also said, uh, until I feel God grab me by the collar, I'm probably not going to do that. But I will be uh, continuing to speak out, continuing to be very supportive of anyone, <laughs> regardless of their party, uh, who oppose the principles of freedom and prosperity in this country and who has a value system consistent with our founding. A little bit more of Dr. Carson's writing. This is from The Big Picture. We have to learn that what matters most in the big picture is not whether we view ourselves as Democrat or Republican, rich or poor, black or white, tall or short, young or old, smart or dumb, successes or failures. What truly matters most in this world is who we are in relation to the one who created it. Uh, you are a Seventh-day Adventist? That's correct. Which is what? Uh, Seventh-day Adventist is a Protestant denomination. Most people don't know very much about them. They say, you guys don't accept blood transfusion. I say, no, nope, that's the Jehovah Witnesses. Almost anything they've heard strange about somebody, they say, that's you guys. No, that's not us. Uh, Seventh-day Adventists are people who believe in the entire Bible. Uh, we don't just like say, well, this section doesn't really count. Uh, including uh, the fourth commandment, which talks about the Sabbath. And uh, we don't believe that the Sabbath uh, was changed. Now, some people do believe that uh, Constantine had the authority to change the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. And, uh, you know, looking through the Bible, we have not found evidence that anybody except God gets to make that declaration. Uh, and then, you know, Adventists are very much like other Protestants and, and, and other regards. We, we believe, uh, you know, that Jesus Christ died for everybody uh, and that he loves everybody and that, uh, you know, God is the ultimate authority and that uh, we should live a life consistent with the principles he's put forth. So services are on Saturdays? Services are on Saturday, although, uh, like many, uh, services for me are every day. Several similar tweets and emails we've received, but this one is from that guy. Um, as a native Detroiter, what do you think about the city's decline and bankruptcy, and do you see any hope for its future? Well, I definitely see hope. Um, you know, obviously I'm, I'm, I'm torn up about what's going on in my home city. I'll always be a Detroiter, uh, no matter what happens. And I was able to get in Detroit what I needed, you know, to play on the world stage. And those things still exist in Detroit. Sometimes, you know, they're a little more difficult to find. But Detroit is a great example of what happens uh, when you have a complex society and you don't control it uh, with the right kind of leadership. Now, a lot of people say, well, it's the unions. The unions destroyed Detroit. Destroyed Detroit. Um, did the unions play a role in it? Of course. But what do unions do? 
you know, in the in the old days, obviously there were terrible working conditions. People were not receiving appropriate wages, things like that. And unions were desperately needed. And I applaud what they did. But uh, as as those kinds of roles became less important, a lot of the unions just began to focus on what's good for their members, not necessarily looking at what's good for the society at large. And uh, they continued to ask and to receive and to take without regard to the fact that they were perhaps strangling the goose that laid the golden egg. Now, it's not all their fault because upper management at a lot of the big three automobile uh, industries are culpable because these guys are not stupid. They're smart. And they're able to project far into the future. And they knew that the concessions that they were making would come back to roost one day. But they would already have their golden parachute and they'd be long gone. So they bear some responsibility here too. And again, that's why it's so important that people work together. Don't sit around and just let one group demonize the other group. Usually there's culpability all around. But if we learn how to discuss these things, we learn how to look at things both short term and long term, and we learn how to explain that to people. And that's the missing part. We don't explain things to people. So they don't really know what's going on. And some people, to their credit, will do research. They'll find out stuff, and they're very informed. They're very intelligent. But for a lot of people, unfortunately, they're a lot more interested in who's on Dancing with the Stars. And, uh, you know, we have to make sure that, that we distill things for them and explain things to them so that they can understand them appropriately. How many speaking enga engagements do you have a year? Uh, right now I'm running at a pace of uh, a, a bit over 100. Do you enjoy them? I very much enjoy them. I I love uh, being out with people. My wife goes with me uh, to all of them. And um, I've been just overwhelmed by how many wonderful people there are out there. And I mean in blue states, red states, you know, everywhere, all, ty all types of groups. And um, if we can just get people to stop being enemies, I think my life would have been very successful. Does Lucina Rustin enjoy going with you and enjoy the uh, interaction, the publicity, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, yeah, uh, a lot of people tell me that she's 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 my best tool. <laughs> she's uh, very outgoing, uh, just absolutely wonderful person, uh, and I thank God every day for her. Musician. She's a musician. Yeah. Well, you know, when we first met, she was a psychology major, music major and pre-med. Uh, at Yale. At Yale. Uh, and she let medicine go, uh, thankfully. And uh, just a terrific musician, gets involved in all kinds of uh, musical things. All of the kids that grew up musically, one was a cellist, one a violist, and one a violinist. And she played violin, so they had a string quartet. A lot of times when I would speak, the string quartet would come along and play. Uh, really, really quite amazing. In uh, his book, Think Big, Dr. Carson reports that he uh, used to do about 450 brain surgeries a year back when he was practicing. Do you miss surgery at all? Um, I, I miss what surgery could accomplish. Um, it might come as a surprise to many people, but I don't really like surgery. <laughs> I don't like the sight of blood, but... I love what can be accomplished. And uh, some people say, you're a surgeon. How can you not like the light side of blood? I said, would you rather have a surgeon who likes the side of blood? <laughs> Put it into perspective for him real quick. Um, but in terms of missing medicine, I do miss medicine, particularly the way it used to be. The way it was becoming when I left, I don't miss. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that we can come up with a system, again, hearkening hark back to my earlier comments, that really works for everybody. We pay twice as much per capita uh, for health care in this country than the next closest nation. And yet, what a mess we have. So it's not because we haven't, you know, allocated enough money. 
It's not because we don't care, but it's because we have a, a very ineffective and inefficient system. And I think we can fix it, and we can do that together. This does not have to be a partisan thing. You know, when, when Obamacare was being uh, you know, brought up, I talked to a very high administration official. Everyone would know the name if I mentioned it. And I said, uh, you know, there are some good things about this program that I think pretty much everybody could agree with. Um, why not, you know, put those things out there as the first stage? And let's incorporate them into what we do. And this will be bipartisan, and we'll continue to work together to build this up into something that really works. I said, because if you push it through with just one party in a very partisan way, first of all, you're going to alienate the other party. They're never going to get any cooperation from them. And I said, uh, you're probably going to lose the House. You may lose the Senate. And you're going to create nothing but chaos and animosity. And this person said, you're probably right. But this is Washington, and this is politics. And when you have attitudes like that, how in the world are we ever going to get our problems fixed? Everything is political. We can do better than this. I'm absolutely positive that we can do better than this. What parts of the Affordable Care Act do you support? Uh, Pre-existing diseases. There's absolutely no reason that people with pre-existing diseases should not be cared for appropriately. Uh, I think that that's very good. Uh, lifetime limits. You know, to tell somebody that your life is only worth so much, and after that, goodbye. That was ridiculous, and we, we needed to get rid of that. Um, I, I'm not super enthusiastic about, you know, leaving kids on their parents' uh, dole until they're 26. Um, I think we needed to be doing everything we can to to get them off of it. At the same time, I'm sympathetic because of the terrible job market that's out there. Um, and at the same time, I feel that the job market doesn't need to be nearly that terrible if we do some logical things. You know, we have the highest corporate tax rates in the world. And we sit here and we complain that companies are doing business offshore. And that demonstrates a fundamental lack of understanding of capitalism. Businesses form to make money. Businesses are not formed to support the government. And some people just don't seem to understand that. So let's understand that and let's do what almost every other nation has done, bring their corporate tax rates down. Even our neighbor to the north, Canada cut there substantially. What happened? <laughs> things that are going up there. You know, we're smarter than that. So, and we talk about it. And you talk to the Republicans and they say, yeah, it's too high. You talk to Democrats, they say, yeah, it's too high. But do we do anything? No. And, uh, you know, by the same token, you know, we need to bring individual taxes and businesses for small and taxes for small business down to a level where people feel like they're working for themselves and not working for the government. You know, that was what caused the in initial revolution. Is there anything to learn from that? I think there probably is. Tampering with everybody, getting into everybody's business. You know, this is a problem. The fact that the IRS is targeting people, targeting organizations, I mean, we should be all completely outraged. But we've gotten so used to stuff, we just say, yeah, yeah, it's terrible. Okay, what's on TV? I mean, it's unbelievable. And that's why it continues, because we're not doing anything about it. Cindy Evans, email. She lives in O'Fallon, Missouri, grew up in Royal Oak, Michigan. As a pro-life neurosurgeon, what is your opinion of embryonic stem cell research and stem cell research in general? Well, I think stem cell research is very important. And I think it will have tremendous ramifications as we learn how to use it. There's, you know, it was a little bit over-promised, quite frankly. And uh, the interesting thing is... Uh, in the scientific uh, community, we're finding that it's actually easier to control adult stem cells. That is, cells that were matured and then they were de-differentiated back to a totally potential stage where they could be redirected. 
as opposed to embryonic stem, stem cells, which tend to be much wilder and much more difficult to control, frequently, uh, you know, deviate off into forming tumors and things of that nature. So as we learn to use adult stem cells, I think the controversy about embryonic stem cell use will dissipate significantly, and the usefulness uh, of that kind of research will benefit all of us. If you can't get through to Dr. Ben Carson in any other form, you can try our Facebook page, facebook.com slash book TV. Right up there at the top, you can make a comment or ask a question for Dr. Carson. Dakota in Newport News, Virginia. Thanks for holding. You're on Book TV. Yes. Hi, Dr. Carson. Hi. I would just like to say to you, thank you. Um, your tape uh, came out, Gifted Hands, your first book, uh, came out to me um, by accident, and I read it, got it from my father. And uh, I talk to a group of young people all the time, and I just wanted to say thank you to you because oftentimes I always mention something from one of your books or I tell a story about you from something I've read because I want them to know and to understand that we have many, many more Americans that have made a contribution to various uh sciences and professions and I hold you in the highest regard well, thank you. Um, because I've just reading that one book when I was 12 made a complete difference in my life and so I have to say thank you um, to you for all of your contributions what you have done in the past your struggle in getting to uh, John Hopkins and where you what you're doing today I say thank Dakota you. what I Dakota, what's your background and what do you do today? Today, um, I work for the Department of Human Services, uh, formerly known as Social Services. Um, I hold two master's degrees, one in criminal justice, the other one in instructional design. Fantastic. And so um, I try to do a lot of community work to help the young people understand that there are more than Martin Luther King's out here. There are Dr. Ben Carson's, and you too can be a replica or an original. And so I would push more toward the original, but Dr. Carson, I have to say, if your sons never tell you, you are my hero. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. And, you know, something you said uh, reminded me when you uh, talk about Dr. King and so many other people, you know, of all races who sacrifice their time, their money, in many cases their lives so that I could have the opportunities. I remember as a youngster looking at television, seeing those dogs sicked on children in those fire hoses. And you know the fact that so many Americans of all backgrounds said that's not who we are and they put their foot down and they stopped it. I'm very grateful for all those people who did that. Who is Curtis Carson? <laughs> Curtis is my brother, uh, my older brother. Uh, he's an engineer, works for Parker Aviation. You know, I became the brain surgeon, he became the rocket scientist. <laughs> but yeah, in a way that's wonderful because it shows that it wasn't a fluke. You know, it, it was a mother uh, who didn't have much going for her, except that she refused to be a victim. And she said, I can go to the library. You can go to the library. We can learn to read. We can learn anything we want to do. We can take advantage of this program and this program, and we are not just going to sit around and say, poor me. And, and if we ever came up with an excuse, she always came out with a poem called Yourself to Blame. You're the captain of your ship. When things go awry, don't blame others. Look at the mirror. You've got yourself to blame. And, you know, growing up with that philosophy was extremely helpful because if people will not accept your excuses, pretty soon you stop looking for excuses and you start looking for solutions. And, you know, my, my brother was a role model for me. You know, when we were in high school, he was a captain. He was the, in the ROTC, he was the company commander. He had all these ribbons and bows, and you know that really inspired me to get into ROTC and to to really work very hard. And you know, fortunately, I became the 
the city executive officer had a chance to meet General Westmoreland and go to Congressional Medal of Honor dinners and was offered a full scholarship to West Point and have always had deep affection uh, for the military. As a result of that, we've always had a lot of military friends. Uh, they're some of the most spectacular people I know. Some people try to denigrate the military. Some of the smartest people I know are in our military, and that's why we're safe. Why did President Bush give you the uh, uh, Presidential Medal of Freedom? Uh, I guess we'd probably have to ask him that question, but you know, I did get to know him over time. We had a lot of conversations. Um, and, you know, I, I had an opportunity to talk to him about a lot of issues. And uh, I believe that he's a lot smarter than most people gave him credit for. Uh, he reads 90 minutes every night before he goes to sleep, has an enormous knowledge of history. And uh, he said something to me that I thought was really funny. He said, a lot of my detractors think I'm stupid, but... Uh, you know, this is my second term in the White House, and they're still out there. Who's the stupid one? <laughs> From your book, The Big Picture, which came out in 2000, you tell the story of Colleen Daniel from Cincinnati. Who is Colleen Daniel? Well, uh, Colleen Daniel uh, actually now is the president of a hospital uh, in Abu Dhabi or one of those areas over there. Uh, she was a vice president of the Johns Hopkins Hospital System. And she was, uh, you know, abandoned uh, as a child, abused, ended up in, you know, foster home, actually escaped <laughs> at age 15, ended up living in uh, Ohio in a basement working as, a, as an accountant for a bookie. And... Um, she would actually hire people to play her parents when she had to have parents at any kind of an affair. And uh, really extremely smart, very industrious, uh, went on to college, got her master's degrees, uh, rapidly rose to the ranks at Hopkins, and as I said now, is uh, president of a large hospital in the Middle East. Why do you put her story in the big picture? Uh, I put her picture in there to, to demonstrate largely that, you know, it's not where you come from, but when you have the right kind of drive, the amazing kinds of things that you can accomplish. Blaselda in New Freedom, Pennsylvania, you've been on the line for a long time and very patient. Thank you. You're on with Dr. Ben Carson. You are welcome. Um, good afternoon, Dr. Carson. Hi. A neurosurgeon and a professor. This a failed health and education, what are your frustrations? Uh, there was a little distortion in what she said. Blaselda, could you repeat your question? Are you still there? A neurosurgeon and a professor. In these two fields, what are your frustrations? As a or professor, an educator, and a surgeon, what are your frustrations? Okay. Uh, well, you know, I, I, I tend not to concentrate so much on the, on the frustrations. Uh, but I do have a philosophy that any time something is not successful, any time you fail, you need to analyze it and ask yourself, is there something to be learned from this? And if you do that each time, your failures and your frustrations will certainly diminish. Um, now, you know, in the field of neurosurgery uh, and in the field of teaching, one of the things that is a little frustrating to me is sort of the, a, a change in attitude that I'm seeing where it's not so much this is my patient as it is this is my shift and this is my job. And, you know, I'd, I'd like to see us return more to, you know, a really good relationship between the patient and the practitioner and that's, again, one of the reasons that I'm really pushing for the health savings accounts because 80% of encounters between the patient and the uh, physician can be handled through the HSA without a need for a third party to intervene and to suck out money, by the way. And uh, that relationship then develops. You know, you are not going to allow 
your doctor to order five CAT scans when you only need one because it's coming out of your HSA. And he knows that, and he's not going to order five when he only needs one. You're going to be working much more closely together. And then I think that this is my patient, this is my doctor type of relationship uh, is only beneficial to everybody. Chapter 10, America the Beautiful. Is health care a right? How do you answer that question? Uh, I don't think health care is a right uh, based on our Constitution, but I think health care is a duty. I think we have a duty to provide basic health care to everybody. And we certainly have the ability to do it. And we certainly have put enough financing in place to do it. And we absolutely need to do it. But, you know, it, it gets back to a bigger question. And that is, what is our duty as a society? You know, one of the reasons that churches tax deductible is because churches do things, or at least they're supposed to. They're not supposed to be social clubs. They're supposed to be out there helping those in need in the community. And uh, one of the wonderful things about that is a relationship. Again, I get back to that, that word, develops between the church and those people in their community that are being helped. And those people in the community feel much more of an obligation to do something with the aid that they're getting, as opposed to getting a check in the mailbox every two weeks, in which case you're just kind of like, in many cases, oh, okay, nah, this is fine, I can deal with this. And this is not what we want. We don't want complacency. We want everybody to be striving and driving to move forward. You know, this is a, a particular... Uh, area of concern for me and the African American community or the black community right now because you know we see poverty increasing. Uh, we see 73% of babies being born out of wedlock. Those babies are four times more likely to grow up in poverty. Their mothers are much less likely to finish their education. We've got tremendous crime, things going on, and economic deterioration. Completely unnecessary. We need to be talking about this in the black community. Uh, those who are leaders in the black community, this is a serious problem. And, you know, teach people economics. You need to learn how to turn over dollars in your own community a couple of times before they go out. That's how you create wealth. And as wealth is being created, you need to reach back and pull the next guy up and help him along the way. You do that, you don't need any help from anybody else. Dr. Carson, in... America the Beautiful. When it comes to health care, you write, contrary to popular belief, one of the reasons many physicians refuse to see indigent patients is not that they cannot pay, but because of the poor treatment they receive from such patients. Yeah. Um, because of our lottery-like system of medical malpractice. Uh, you know, and, and we're, we're one of the few places in the world that have this problem with malpractice. And a lot of patients recognize that physicians and hospitals are concerned about it, and, you know, they bully them. And, you know, I, I'm going to sue if this doesn't happen. I've seen that so many times, and it's so disgusting. And, and, and what it really says to us is that we need to some tort reform. You know, it's a big problem. It costs a lot of money, defensive medicine. And uh, it creates you know, an atmosphere that I don't think is conducive uh, to good care. And, uh, you know, what is it that's going on in this country that isn't going on in every other country that makes this such a big problem? There's one thing that we have that they don't have. It's called the Trial Lawyers Association. And they make a lot of money out of it. And you look at a field like mine, neurosurgery, nine out of ten malpractice cases are without merit. But, you know, some of those lawyers, and some lawyers are very ethical. I know some malpractice lawyers who won't take a, a case like that. But a lot of them, they just want a case. And they know that the hospital, the insurance company, the doctor, they don't want to be tied up in court for months, you know, going through this silliness. And if they can find the right number, settlement, which happens in the vast majority of cases, they get their cut, they go to look for the next case. And, you know, there's no consequences. And you might become a millionaire. You know, that doesn't make any sense. 
we have to fix that. Why was that not in the health care reform bill? I'll tell you why it wasn't there. Because the president is in bed with the Trial Lawyers Association. And they didn't want it in there. In fact, I was at a public forum, and Howard Dean, I don't agree with much of what he has to say, but uh, he was asked a question, why is it not in the health care bill? And he said, well, it's simple. Uh, the Trial Lawyers Association gives us a lot of money, and they don't want it in there. Boom. Uh, Dr. Carson, do doctors have a role in the cost of our health care? Are doctors paid too much? Are doctors paid too much? Um, I don't think they are paid too much. Recognize that, <clears throat> you know, in college, when everybody was partying, doctors are grinding because they got to get the grades to get into medical school. And then when they get to medical school, it's um, goodbye, family. I love you. Don't take the fact that you never hear from me that I don't love you. They're grinding away. You know, the, the first two years of medical school, the amount of material you have to learn is likened to learning eight new foreign languages simultaneously. It's an enormous task. And then you become an intern and a resident where you learn how to put everybody else's agenda on the front burner and yours on the back burner. You become an attending. You know, you miss your son's birthday party. You miss your anniversary dinner. You're missing everything because emergencies don't look at your schedule. Uh, no, they're not paid too much money. Um, and also, look at the length of time, the training that you've got to go through. You know, people who go into law or business, you know, by the time you get done, you know, they're already well into their careers making lots of money. And you've been skating along not making a whole lot of money. And uh, I think a lot of people also have a misperception about how much money doctors actually make. Even neurosurgeons who are at the top of the scale, you know, in Philadelphia, the malpractice premium for a neurosurgeon, if you've never had a lawsuit, $300,000 a year. You know, that has to come out of your earnings. You've got to pay lots of overhead and things. You know, by the time you get to paying all that, the, believe me, you are not making an exorbitant amount of money. So, no, I don't think they make too much money. What do you bring to a company whose board you serve on, such as Kellogg's? Um, well, different perspectives, particularly about, you know, health, uh, health care, um, but a lot of social uh, issues as well. And, uh, you know, interestingly enough, you know, people in science and people in medicine frequently do not get involved in things outside of their fields. And I think that's to the detriment because we're trained to make decisions based on facts, based on evidence, not on emotion, not on ideology, not on philosophy. And I think that is something that is extremely useful in any discipline. And I encourage many more people in the fields of medicine and science to get in more involved in your community and what's going on. Reading has purpose. Uh, posts on our Facebook page. Um, I love the mention of A.G. Gaston, African-American businessman who was able to become a millionaire in Birmingham, Alabama in the 30s. It prompted me to see if Gaston wrote an autobiography. He did, and it's just been republished to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the civil rights events of 1963. I ordered a copy while sitting here watching the interview. And uh, Rachel asks the question, what happened to your father if he was absent did that or does that play a role in the kind of father husband you are today? Yes, well, A.G. Gaston's book, Green Power, is a great story, I gotta tell you. I recommend it for anybody of any race that's really quite inspirational. Uh, my father died many years ago. Did you ever see him again after that day in 1959? Yes, uh, I saw, last time I saw him was the day I was married. He, he came to the wedding. You know, I never, never harbored any uh, ill will uh, toward him, even though, you know, I know he wasn't my mother's favorite person <laughs> after she found out he was a bigamist and that he wouldn't pay child support either. But after a while, she just, you know, stopped pursuing it and just said, I I'll, I'll deal with it myself. Um, you know, I think, you know, he was largely a victim of his upbringing. Um, 
And the interesting thing is, you know, when, when they moved from Tennessee to Detroit, uh, my mother was able to take his salary working in a factory, put aside significant portions of it, and they were able to acquire a large amount of real estate in Detroit. And unfortunately, he kind of got into drugs and stuff and gambled it all away. But if that man had had the wisdom to listen to my mother, <laughs> they'd have been very rich people. Brad in St. Augustine, Florida, you're on with Dr. Ben Carson. Yes, good afternoon, Dr. Carson. It's a pleasure to speak with you. Pleasure. I'd like to ask you a two-part question, the first being, what is your opinion of the radio broadcaster Rush Limbaugh? And secondly, do you feel he has a positive or a negative impact upon society? Thank you. Okay. Well, you know, I think Rush Limbaugh serves a very useful purpose uh, in our society because he breaks things down. He looks at things. He analyzes it. You know, uh, some of his analysis, you know, I might not agree with. Uh, but a lot of them I do agree with. And because a lot of people have tried to demonize him, people look at what he says in light of that demonization as opposed to the merits of what it is. And I think, you know, Rush Limbaugh, you know, on one side, some of the people we see on MSNBC on the other side, you know, we, we need to stop, you know, taking these people and, and say, you know, you're bad, you're good. Forget about all that stuff. Listen to what they have to say and, and, and analyze the merits of what they have to say rather than always trying to focus on the individual. Next call for Dr. Carson comes from Peter in Vancouver, Washington. Hi, Peter. Hello. Um, thank you, TV, for being there. And Dr. Carson, thank you for your courage. Thank you. Um, I was uh, just wondering... Um, do you think it's necessary for a third party? Um, I, I would like to think of something like uh, the We the People Party. <laughs> um, also, um, you have my nickel, and please accept it before it says something else other than in God we trust. Thank you. I'll take your comments off the phone. Thank you. Yes. Well, um, you know, the, the third party issue... I would not like to see that occur um, because even though on the surface it seems like a very good idea, um, it can result in a perpetuation of just the thing that the third party arose to dissipate by splitting a vote. What I'd rather see happen is the third party, for instance, the, the, the Tea Party, to analyze the Democratic Party, analyze the Republican Party, and see which one more closely fits their values, and then try to work within that party to make changes. Now, I realize that they chose the Republican Party as more of uh, a party that was for governance by the people. Um, and I realize that they've created some real havoc in the <coughs> Republican Party because the traditional Republican Party has been a grow government party. Um, if there can't be some accommodation, perhaps there is room for a third party. I know a lot of people who are Democrats. I just spent, you know, a weekend with an ardent Democrat uh, who really... Whose, whose, whose philosophies really are Republican. They just are traditionally Democrats. You know, we, we need to sort of get rid of these labels and, and, and talk about solutions. And people need to start voting across party lines because the philosophy that the individual holds is much more important than the party to which they belong. This party loyalty stuff, let me tell you, it's crap. It's a way to control you. Don't allow people to manipulate you into a party. Make sure that you align with the principles, not with the party. Well, Stephen H. Uh, sends this in via email. What prevents you from running for president in 2016, and why do you avoid the question? Uh, I don't avoid the question, and nothing prevents me from doing it, except 
I don't feel a need to do it. I don't feel a calling to do it. Um, will things change? I don't know. Uh, you know, if there were, were, were no candidates that anybody could get enthusiastic about and, you know, there was a large outcry, you know, I would have to pay attention to that. I don't see that happening. I see my role really as more of, of someone who can, can provide background for people to make good decisions. Just a few minutes left with our in-depth guest this month, Dr. Ben Carson, author of five books with one on the way. Christy in Reno, hi. Hi, thank you so much. Um, God bless you, Dr. Carson. Thank you. I've um, been learning about you for quite some time. My mom um, felt like your mom was a hero for some of the things she was able to do. Um, my question is about your 3D thinking. You said, uh, I, I understand a little bit about this. I think that's how my son thinks. However, you said that in med school, two-dimensional thinking was easier. So I'm surprised by that, and hope you'll explain more. Yeah, well, uh, by what I mean by two-dimensional thinking is just sort of seeing everything on the same plane. And when that happens, it's much easier, much more difficult, rather, for you to keep relationships in mind. So p people who have to deal with a lot of spatial relationships are people who tend to uh, excel in three-dimensional type thinking. Uh, that's all. It's, it's not a denigration of anybody. Uh, it simply is to say some people have certain talents or gifts and they need to recognize what those are and to use them appropriately. I tell young people all the time to sit back and assess what your gifts are. Talk to people who know you, who've known you your whole life. See what they think your gifts are. And then in terms of a career, choose something that fits your gifts and talents and you'll do much better. Dean posts on our Facebook page, Dr. Carson, with a greater percentage of our population becoming dependent to some degree on the federal government, it seems the majority of the people in our nation are yielding to an ever-increasing pull toward a socialist type of government. Can the people of this great nation be awakened to what is happening? Can they foster the strength to overcome? Uh, yes, I believe they can be awakened. Again, it, it goes back to uh, sometimes there's a failure to explain to people the consequences of their actions, the long-term consequences. They can see the short-term, but they frequently cannot see the long-term. And we, uh, those of us who feel that capitalism works, that feels that our Judeo-Christian uh, moral system works, we need to be much more effective in the way that we explain these things. We need to be kind and compassionate when we, you know, talk about spending cuts. We need to be putting a lot more emphasis on how we grow the, op grow the economy, how we make opportunities for people, than how we slash their benefits. Because, of course, they'll be concerned when you do that. And there are ways that this can be done. And again... I invite people from both parties, Republicans and Democrats, as well as independents like myself, to work together to solve these problems. We're not doing ourselves any good when we, you know, put ourselves into our little corners and throw hand grenades at each other rather than focus on fixing the problems. Gary is in Victoria, Texas. And Gary, you're on Book TV on C-SPAN 2 with Dr. Carson. Thank you so much. Hey, I'm a surgeon down here, and Good. first I think a great ticket would be you and Charles Krauthammer. Having said that, uh, how do you feel about the fact that when we all started practicing medicine, we were kind of respected and honored, and now it's kind of like a, a big game for the insurance companies, the attorneys, the hospitals, and everybody else to demonize us, and uh, patients are, are kind of biased before they come and see us. They're, they assume we're going to be doing something wrong, and they just can't wait for that to happen. And I must say, in my 25 years, I've never turned away a patient. I'm a plastic surgeon. You'll never see an American adult without a repaired cleft lip or palate. You go to Italy, you go to Mexico, you go to Spain, they don't get repaired with their children. Nobody does free care for them except if we decide to go over there and do it. Yes. So anyway, back my, my question was, how do you think we as physicians should deal with being demonized pretty much in everything we do for being physicians? Gary, how long have you been a plastic surgeon? 25 years. 
And as you were saying earlier, I did a plastic surgery residency, a general surgery residency, a burn fellowship, a microsurgery fellowship, and everybody thinks I make too much money. Um, what's your malpractice a year, if we could ask? Well, I've, I've been in practice over 25 years. I've had zero lawsuits. So my malpractice is $80,000 a year. 80000 uh, uh, First of all, you know, just an example of the kind of person that I was talking about. You know, most physicians, absolutely wonderful, above board, out there to help people, being demonized, so to speak, by a system. Now, part of the problem is that physicians tend to be relatively meek and mild. You know, they don't really speak up for themselves. And uh, the insurance companies discovered that some years ago. You can do anything to these guys and they're not going to say anything. You know, can you imagine if somebody came along to lawyers and said, you know what, I know you're charging a hundred bucks, but I'm giving you five. <laughs> you think they would settle for that? No way. But docs, okay, well, whatever. And um, so, you know, doctors need to begin to speak up more. Uh, and they need, they, they, they need to be forceful like we were in the early parts of this nation when, like I said, five physicians signed a Declaration of Independence. We were much more involved in every aspect of society. And the more involved we are, the more our points of view will be realized, the more people will recognize the contributions that we make, the less effective those who try to demonize us will be. And in Gifted Hands, Ben Carson's story, you write, successful people don't have fewer problems. They have determined that nothing will stop them from going forward. Exactly. D Go ahead. No. Um, you know, everybody has problems in life, and really, whether you succeed or fail is a matter of how you relate to them. If you see the obstacle as a containing fence, it becomes your excuse for failure. And if you see it as a hurdle... Each one strengthens you for the next. So again, it's a matter of choice. How do you decide to see things? How do you decide to see yourself? David's in Bismarck, North Dakota, the only state in the Union that Ben Carson has not visited. Hi, David. Uh, good morning. Hi. I have, uh, I have a question, and then I have an invitation. Okay. <laughs> the, the question is, I know that you're a Christian, and I was wondering, was there a certain point in time in your life that you became a believer? Uh, well, you know, I, I I grew up sort of in the church and believing, but the time when it really became very real to me is the day that I tried to stab another youngster. And uh, that belt buckle that he had on, you know, the life, knife blade struck and, and it broke. But um, that three hours that I spent in the bathroom thinking about my life, contemplating, praying, reading the Bible... God became very real to me that day and has been extremely real to me ever since that time. I'm not a highly religious person, but I do have a very deep and abiding relationship with God. David, your follow-up? You mentioned earlier this morning that you'd never been to North Dakota. Well, we, we have a lot going on up here. We have one of the strongest uh, economies in the nation. Two billion dollars in the black and two percent unemployment. So as a, as a citizen of the great state of North Dakota, we'd like to extend an invitation to you. All right. Well, when the, when the right invocation comes along for the right event, I'll be there. <laughs> and Kelvin, we only have a minute left. Kelvin's calling from Orlando. Go ahead. Yes. Good afternoon, Dr. Carson. Hi. Um, I'm a vet. Yeah, hi, sir. I'm a vet, and um, I have a question for you. Um, I understand that the... Iran and Egypt, they had a, you know, conversation going on for 30 years, and they just resolved it, and now I understand that they have some, I guess, animosity towards um, Israel. Where do you see that going? Well, you know, there's been animosity in the Middle East uh, since the days of uh, Jacob and Esau, and uh, I'm sure you know that whole story of how things evolved, uh, but it actually even started before that with uh, Ishmael and Isaac having the same father, uh, Abraham. Um, there's, there never has been peace. <laughs> Will there be peace? I don't know. Should we attempt uh, to create situations where there's peace? Absolutely. Um, are the Israelis our friends? Absolutely. They have been always. Uh,
Many of the entities in the Middle East countries have been our friends. Uh, some have not been our friends. You know, we have to always be willing to extend the olive branch, but we also have to be fair, and we have to be loyal, and we have to try to do what's right. Uh, uh, by the same token, uh, I don't think we necessarily have to have our nose in everything. Um, and, you know, I may be one of the few people, for instance, uh, who doesn't agree with us being in Afghanistan. You know, Afghanistan is not one uh, solitary nation. There are 300 tribes in Afghanistan. One doesn't listen to the other. No one's ever been able to, to tame Afghanistan. Why do we think that we could tame it? There are things we could do there with uh, covert actions, with drones, etc. I have no problem with that. But to send our troops over there to get killed and not to change anything? Not so great. Dr. Ben Carson's first book, Gifted Hands, came out in 1990, followed by Think Big. The Big Picture came out in 2000. Take the Risk, 2008, America the Beautiful, 2011. And there's a new book on the way for the last three hours we've been talking with Dr. Ben Carson.